to the amend and select board March 27th, 2024 meeting. Uh, if you could please stand and join me for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic which stands one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. We have a lot on the agenda tonight and uh, just uh, before we get started, so I'm Elena Brugos, I'm vice chair, our uh, chair Mike Morali is traveling for work, uh, so I will be running the meeting. Uh, we are going to take a couple of things out of order on the agenda, just so you know, because we have a lot of budget presentations, so things are going to uh, we go late tonight. Uh, but I would like to start off by uh, calling for uh, citizen statements and petitions. on item three, correspondence, and we actually have several items of correspondence. Um, the first is uh, the Friends of Menden Elders uh, have written about their annual progressive yard sale on Saturday, June 8th, 2024. Um, so one of you be able to read that so can save my voice. Do you have it handy? And the correspondence goes as follows. Dear board members, the friends of the men and elders would like to again hold our annual townwide progressive yard sale on Saturday, June 8th, 2024, with a rain date of Sunday, June 9th. All proceeds from this, our major fundraiser, go towards enhancing the senior center and supporting the programs for our men and seniors. The friends will be charging $20 to the participating residents. We are responsible for all advertising and publishing a directory for the sale with a map listing of all the yard sale participants. The directory will be available to shoppers at the senior center on the morning of the event. We have asked the police chief for his approval and will advise of all yard sale activities in town that day and, sa uh, and safety guidelines will be published in the directory. The friends hope that you are again able to approve this event plan for June 8th, 2024. Thank you for your consideration. So, sincerely, Carolyn Wass. So on that note, so uh, it used to be the case that the select board needed to approve requests for uh, yard sales, and that is no longer the case. So there is no official um, approval required from the select board. Uh, however, I guess you know I can personally encourage people to uh, participate in in this um, event. It's the Friends of Mend and Elders do a lot of important work for our seniors for the senior center uh, funding activities and events uh, and generally helping our senior center. Um, any any other comments on that? Right. So thank you. So we will let them know that we read their letter, but that they don't actually need our official approval. Um, and second, we have uh, the Nipmuc Youth Baseball uh, Parade Permit. Any volunteers? Still working on emails. Okay. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Brendan. I can do it. So, good evening. I hope this email finds you all well. I'm reaching out on behalf of the Nitmuck Youth Baseball and Nitmuck Youth Softball to request a parade permit from the select board. We're looking to hold our parade on April 20th, 2024, with the start time of time of 10 a.m. Below are the details of the parade and ceremony. Uh, teams will line up on Kelly Road beginning at 9:30. The parade will begin at 10 a.m. Head down Millville Road and end at Memorial Park. Bazella Little League Field. Teams will line up outside of the Bazella fence in the same order that they proceeded in the parade. Each team will be introduced and will run will run onto the field, lining up around the infield. Once all teams have been announced and run on the field, we'll begin the ceremony. Uh, Chris Corbett. Thank you. And then, uh, so in this case, we actually do need to give permission for the parade permit. Um, so is it... Uh, do I have a motion? I move to approve a parade permit for the Nipmuc Youth Baseball, Nipmuc Youth Softball to be held on Saturday, April 20th, 2024, with a start time of 10 a.m. from Millville Road to Memorial Park, Pizella Little League Field. Second. Is there any further discussion? Okay. Uh, all in favor? Aye. Aye. The motion has been passed. All right, and then uh, item C is uh, the Menden Lions Club toll road request. I got you. 
<laughs> Honorable board members, the Menden Lions Club once again is asking permission from the Board of Selectmen for the following Lions Club fundraising event. This event has uh, been held over the past several years and has been most successful in our community fundraising efforts. Day and time to be considered and approved by the board, which is Saturday, May 11th, 2024, with a rain date of May 18th, 2024. The toll road corner of Route 16 and North Avenue. Uh, the time of the event is 8.30 a.m. to 12 noon. And as in the past, we will go over the details on public safety with Police Chief David Kersey. We will provide insurance certificate as in the past to the board. And your consideration is again appreciated by the Menden Lions Club. Thanks, Dick Ferrucci. Thank you. And once again, uh, we do need to give a formal approval for this request. So I would be looking for a motion. Move to approve the Menden Lions Club request for a toll road Saturday, May 14th, 2024. Rain date to be uh, May 18th, 2024 at the corner of Route 16 and North Ave from 8.30 a.m. to 12 noon. Second. Any further discussion? Okay, all right. The, um, so all in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, thank you, the motion passes. All right, and then now, how are we doing for time? Pretty well. Uh, so uh, I would like to take our first uh, out of like rearrangement, uh, which is to consider the interim town administrator contract. Um, our uh, candidate who we interviewed last week said he would be able to join us. Um, He's on right now. And so um, I guess I would ask the board, uh, the board has, uh, we had a chance to look at the, the draft contract for the contract. Um, and there have been some additional negotiations since our last meeting. Um, so, uh, See, Greg, are you are you online? Yes, it's right. Yep, it's right there. Yes. Yeah, Greg, Greg is here. Okay. So uh thank you for joining us. Um and I guess uh so I guess I would like to um open it up to the board to discuss if there are any uh questions. So there was a background check run and it came back clean. Uh and we so we would uh like to find out whether the board would like to move forward with the contract discussion. All right. Uh, well, I guess the question is then uh, do do would anyone like to make a motion to formally enter into the contract with the new um, starting rate that was uh, negotiated? A question about the contract before we go on. Uh, I've noticed a few Scrivener's errors, uh, just spelling and things like that. Okay. Do we have a chance to, to make those changes or does, does it not even matter at this point? That's a good question. What do you think, David? In terms of making like Scrivener's spelling, spelling, spelling. Yeah, we can correct those. So, I mean, potentially those could be included in the motion, sort of pending, pending. Um, pending uh, I guess, editorial, editorial edits. <laughs> yeah. I think the one thing I would say is, um, with the uh, if we move ahead on this, we should probably have for an agenda item. And you know, to be fair to to Greg, because he actually brought this up in his interviews, we want to be I want to be very specific with what we're asking him to take on. Yes. As we get into this, so it's not it's it's at duties as required in the contract, which is you know it covers a lot. Right. But I think as a board, we should be very specific what we expect over the next ninety days. To be fair to the candidate, so that he knows what he's stepping into, and he knows get you know hit the ground running. Right. Okay. Uh -huh. I think that that's a great point. So we can request that that be added to our perhaps next week agenda. Or, or yeah. Um. And Greg, do you have any uh, questions for us? Um. Hello. Um. No, I don't have any questions at all. I thought that the the process went smoothly and. Uh, the version that you have in front of you is the version of the agreement that I approved. Okay, so we will we will uh, I guess check back with you about the the minor edits that Brendan has asked about 
I assume it's just the first line that says vacant effective July 1st, 2023, or did you not see that one? Yeah, and some spelling. Okay. Just a couple of just, yeah, some kind of spelling errors. So I would be looking for a motion. Oh, there's there an additional question. Yeah, yes. the, uh, the new negotiated rate. Uh, yes. Any details? So be discussed here or uh, so I mean, it, I was not directly part of those negotiations, but uh, yes, they were requested and I, they were close to what we had had publicly discussed last week. So it's Elena. It. Yes. Hi, it's it's Jen O'Neill. Um, thank you. Hi, just a quick question. I think you pointed out something. The, the position, the the town administrator position has been vacant since July 1st, 2023. Ah. So I think that's what if you if if that's what I'm if that's what they're questioning. I see. So. Oh, will be versus has been right. So. Yes, that does. Okay. I, I see what you're I see your point. <laughs> yes, does it does that does that uh, answer your concerns, Brendan? Uh, it, it it does. Um, besides the spelling errors. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. Okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Send send me the spelling errors, and I'll I'll make the changes and have that ready for tomorrow. Right. Yes. Right. Because it's the the right. It's for those of you uh, who don't have the contract here. It says whereas the uh, office of town administrator will be vacant effective July first, twenty twenty three, which is true. It. it the office of town administrator has not been filled. We've had an interim town administrator, so it's different, different position. Okay. All right, thank you, Jen. So do I have, do I have a motion? So is there a detail about the actual delta? If you can't say the actual number, is there? Oh, so it's in the motion. It's in the motion, I'm sorry. It's in the motion, um, but it's $80 an hour. Which it was up from, I think, 76. 72. 72. Okay. Okay. I think 75. The number 72. And <laughs> correctly. Right. I think, yeah, we, right. Yes. Got it. All right. I moved to enter into a contract with Greg Balaconis as town amendments interim town administrator at a rate of $80 per hour up to 24 hours per week, uh, pending correcting of the scrivener's errors in the contract. Second. And then actually there's no start date in this. Do we want that in the motion? I'm sorry. Oh, there's no start date. In the motion. In the motion. Do we have that? Has a start date been discussed through this negotiation? But that's another good question. Yeah, could Okay, so has I guess been, it's no, start, start, start date to be determined then. I okay. did get an answer. Has, it, they, right. has a start date been discussed? Then maybe do you have an answer to that question? I'm assuming it's April 1st since your term ends at the end of March, right? Ends tomorrow. Can we confirm that? Do it tomorrow. Even better. So, so, Greg, is there a start? Did you have a start time uh, date discussed with you? Yeah, I, I spoke with the chair and I'm ready to come on board April 1st, which is this coming Monday. And Mike, that should be in the contract as it, I think it's the, the contract runs April 1st to June 30th. Okay. Karis approved, Karis approved this contract, so. Excellent. I'll send you reference of April or. Oh, I see. Yes, first line entered into on the first day of April 2024. <laughs> Thank you. All right, so there has been a motion made. Yes. Yeah, made and seconded. Made and seconded. Okay, is there any further discussion? Uh, then all in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. All right, so we have had, so we're doing pretty well for time. So we've had another request to take an item out of order, which is to address the Providence Street update, because that's been a concern of a lot of the public and it possibly will be quick. So is is John Dudley on the call? Uh, yeah, he is. I am. What's that? Gonna do the Good evening. So I got first of the budget presentation. Yes, another meeting enough. 
Right. Okay. Oh, so do you want, you think we could, yeah, we could we, do that actually. Yeah. Hold on one moment. So possibly we're going to do Blackstone, Blackstone Valley presentation first and then interrupt our budget. Sorry, John. Briefly. <laughs> sorry, sorry. Little, little miscommunication there. So thank you, John. All right. So, uh, do we, so I guess we can move along then to item four. We'll begin our item four with the FY25 budget presentations. Uh, and I would be looking for uh, a representative from BBT to join us. And this is also a joint meeting of the, the FinCom. Well, it may not be a joint meeting. We've got Jack. Okay. Here's who we got. Right here. I guess with just me and Jack, we don't have quorum. Okay. So, so I guess, but you're here. So. Yeah. I'm down. I hope. All right. Well, still not a quorum, but close, but not together. Oh, no. And who we got? Oh, great. Right. All right. Okay. This is. We got. All right. We got some. Um, I have to just open them because I can relay them. So these are. So everybody has a copy no, of it. The, the, so like four ones right yeah. now. <clears throat> I complained. Yeah. Yeah, it wasn't. It wasn't mine. Yeah, had them all in the envelope. Right. Okay. 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 Here for your help. So if, if you I mind may introduce yes. yourself. And yeah, yeah, certainly. I'm Dr. Michael Fitzpatrick, and I've served as your vocational technical superintendent for 31 years. I previously worked with your town administrator, Mr. Demange, and it was great to work with him again. Um, like uh, among your audience guests is the uh, vice chair of my school committee, uh, Mr. Finn, uh, who, who resides in Millville. All right, uh, the local representative to our school committee, uh, uh, Ed. Yeah. Okay, uh, and also my assistant superintendent principal, Anthony Steele, who's uh, in training for this opportunity as soon as it opens up. Okay, so, <laughs> uh, which won't be too far away. <laughs> so, in any case, um, thank you for the opportunity to share this information with you and other key policymakers. Uh, it's been a privilege to serve the town. I think the first chair of the finance committee I worked with was Mr. Holmes. Okay, and so, uh, but it's always been a professional exchange, and uh, it, it, we welcome that. Bring up to him. What's different for us is we have 13 town managers, five changes this year alone. Um, we have 60 select persons uh, and 126 finance committee members. And so we accept that challenge as we draw students from the district. We know many of them, and they know us, which is fine. Okay. Um, I grew up in Milford right next door, spent a lot of time in your community, and my father served on the, uh, the school committee and finance committees in Milford years ago. Uh, to be helpful, I provided advance information to the town manager, which generally we do. Usually that's helpful. I think Mr. Goddard has some questions. Uh, we, we do our best to, to give you, provide you with placeholders or planning information. We've never hesitated to do that. It's a challenge because sometimes the state information doesn't come as early as we would like. Um, uh, school systems across the Commonwealth of Massachusetts have witnessed a, a significant reduction, if you will, in the basic aid, Chapter 70. The mere $30 a student, uh, you know, might buy postage, but not much else. And so with no apologies, the governor has indicated that the state revenues were not as robust as they were under the previous governor, Baker, uh, and that she uh, felt the need, working with the Department of Revenue, to switch the burden of funding responsibility primarily to the 351 communities. And so we most witnessed a significant increase in the absolute minimum obligation, which is a component of the budget, as you well know, uh, generated by the state, not by us, uh, and, um, and not a great deal of state revenue. So um, I'm gonna walk through the summary sheet if I could, because I think that brings you to the, and I appreciate you taking me 
So I would just like to invite our director to come to the table. Oh, by all means. Like to, Jody, it's up to you, but I know that you've been on top of this budget, so it'd be great to have you at the table. Sorry to interrupt. Go right ahead. Right here, okay. Thanks. Sure. Okay. <clears throat> I don't know where the extra sheets went over. Oh, it's okay. Well, you have one of the other summary sheets. Do you need that? Thank you. It's, it's on the way, Joe. Thank you. Thank you. If I may. So the, I, I, we have a good news story to share. And so anytime that's helpful, that makes us more popular in Menden than it makes us in some of the other towns. Okay, and that's you know all part of the job too. So the operational assessment for the 25 budget request before you and submitted in advance of tonight for planning purposes is the number of $1,365,107. The debt, which was previously approved 19 years ago, uh, is uh, in its last year in FY25 for the previous uh, project, which was the $36 million expansion renovation, which was reimbursed by the state at 75.5%. We move quickly at, at that time. Uh, unfortunately, we don't see that kind of level of reimbursement in the term. So the total is the number, once again, was provided $1,374,882. I hope that matches what I gave you. That's always good to see. Uh, um, and that represents a reduction from the previous year of $128,142. And we're pleased to be able to do that. Uh, I'll walk you through some of the comments made here. Um, one of the reasons we uh, were able to have the reduction is there are fewer students, there are now 75 students, uh, and that contributes, but it doesn't control uh, the, the numbers. Otherwise, every school system across the state that had fewer students, and that's most of them, uh, would have a reduction in their budget, but that's not usually the case. And inflation doesn't permit that. So we had a special request of Milford because of their additional, uh, let's say, commercial base uh, and some of the federal money they received uh, to ask them for over and above the budget that they approved with us last year, which was approved by all 13 towns unanimously, if they would be willing to consider a special warrant article of $50,000 uh, so we could use it to repair, frankly, the grease traps, not the most popular, but certainly pretty basic of our culinary arts laboratory. They agreed to do that and we initiated the changes uh, and then they reimbursed us. We applied for the discretionary funding from the legislature. We have three state reps, three senators and five state reps. We maintain pretty close contact with them. We do our best to respond to their challenges and their constituent request. Uh, so we had two requests, one of which was awarded for 88,000 uh, that allowed us to remove the oil tank without any cost to the towns and a new 80,000 that is before them now. We are waiting to hear about that. Um, we continue to secure additional donations from the area banks and credit unions as a special effort to pay or subsidize the cost of using the vans that the students use for travel and work projects. Uh, at the last tally, that was an amount of 20,000. There are additional considerations. Uh, we incorporate solar farms. We don't use the property on, uh, in Upton uh, because of its limited acreage, but we do use outside solar farms, generating reductions uh, in, in electrical costs. And then we have, we're, we have a pretty good reputation for being very competitive and relative to competing for grants, both formula and competitive. Uh, last year, we secured $3 million in grants, but because of supply demands, we're still implementing some of those grants. And so we, you know, it's kind of a carryover. Uh, one example of that is the construction technology department is currently installing a brand new dust collector unit, which will improve air quality. Uh, but, and that's a, you know, almost a three quarter of a million dollar item in itself totally funded by grants from the federal, state government, uh, but it took a while for us to put that in place as far as the bidding and, and the other. Um, and so the other grants, the new ones uh, are, are, you know, almost 1.2 million. So we, we will continue to pursue that. In terms of the number of students served by Menden, as I previously mentioned, is 75. Um, the per pupil assessment is listed there. Um, again, significantly impacted by the state's absolute minimum. The absolute minimum contribution by the state saw a decrease of 66,563. But as I pointed out in my introductory remarks here, you received almost double the reduction with the other adjustments we made. So we didn't just rely upon the absolute minimum change in the state that the budget subcommittee, by the way, Mr. Cray and Mr. Finn from the school committee both served on that budget subcommittee. And 
my assistant made multiple presentations to it. Uh, uh, they met in public posted session uh, over several months to build the budget. Uh, the dropout rate for the school is considered to be zero. Just keep in mind, we are a high school only population. Uh, and there are sometimes occasionally where someone relocates to Florida or someplace else where it's not as cold as here. Um, uh, but generally speaking, uh, the people, the students who come in just do not leave. Um, the completion rate of students and the success of the staff, again, to the principal and others has been 100 percent. Many school systems across the Commonwealth uh, are experiencing chronic absenteeism, which is uh, not just the Commonwealth, but across the nation, uh, and it's sad to see that. Uh, but with the motivation of coming to our school, uh, for the 1,260 students that are in the school, voting to 75 in Menden, the daily student attendance rate is above 97%. We're glad to see that. Uh, also, the, the, the teachers come to work too, which is kind of good, and so do the administrators. Um, one of the changes that we made, we have a, uh, we continue to protect uh, the, through the collective bargaining process, the longest school year of 193 teaching days. So it's a, you know, a good 6% greater than the, the required year, uh, but it's covered within the total budget. And we're pleased to see that uh, and as we rebound from COVID, that now we have 150 students in the senior class that are in cooperative education. Our instruction is a week of classes with integrated uh, vocational tactical skills, uh, meeting all the rigors of the MCAS, which is underway just this past couple of days, uh, and with the following with a week of shop. Okay, and the week of shop allows us to do it like a Northeastern University co-op program, and these students report to the industries they're pursuing, earning at least minimum wage and get a head start for the trades. So the next page is a list of the grants in case people wanted to see the specifics. Um, we, we like to be precise relative uh, to exactly uh, you know, what we've earned, what we've secured, and so that's where we're able to provide it. I apologize for the smaller print. Uh, I understand, I'm aware that Mr. Goddard and others raised some questions about the bond. Okay, this year, uh, as, I, as I near the end of my career, I was also asked to sell. $10 million bond, and I, which is okay. Uh, we, we hit, our roof is of the age where we need to address that. Uh, and we closely monitored whether or not the state would reopen what's known as the Mass School Building Authority Accelerated Repair Program. It closed for a number of years. When the state did that, we pounced, okay? We moved quickly uh, to submit a thorough application. I can share the application and all the estimates that went into the project, and I have a copy for you if you'd like it. Okay. I just Sorry to interrupt. My only question was to get the term and the information on the bond. I'm all for roofs. Good. No question about the project itself. I just want to make be clear on. That. Okay, good to hear. And, and I hope this next sheet helps respond to okay. greater detail yep. to my first answer that was forwarded to me by the town, town manager. Okay, but so um, the uh, Menden uh, has a 6.4% ownership in the bond if it advances. Uh, and um, uh, the the specific 20 year amortization table is listed here. Uh, it, it is front loaded to reduce the interest. The treasurer and the bond council recommend that strongly. As I think you can see the, the, the merit of that or the logic of it. Um, we are committed to uh, a successful approval by the Mass School Building Authority for the portion that they would reimburse. And then we're, we will be pursuing a number of uh, energy re rebates for the other portion, the HVAC units. Um, the last Mass School Building Authority accelerated repair project, we've had three uh, recently, uh, was reimbursed at 55 percent. We've confirmed with the Mass School Building Authority contacts that we know, uh, because we've worked with them for, for multiple projects, that they were impressed with the application we submitted. They said it was very thorough. Uh, they had received 72 applications in total from 39 different schools. Uh, or communities, I guess you could say. Um, the reason is the difference between the 39 to the 72 is some of the cities submitted multiple projects for multiple buildings within the city. Okay. Um, the, uh, um, so we, we, we certainly hope we were su successful. Uh, the, there was a, a request um, during our first five finance committee presentations. The Milford Finance Committee, again, with having a little more revenue than some, uh, fully endorsed uh, the request, but others were hesitant, okay? And they said, would we possibly marry or uh, create a condition of the Mass School Building Authority approval within the book? Uh, again, my school committee has always tried to 
reach middle ground, whether we're negotiating with teachers uh, or others or work with our communities. So we made that change and modified that in the warrant language that went to you. It was a change from the first warrant language, but it shows that we're going to meet people halfway. Um, the uh, as soon as we are, first of all, the bond can only be used for this project. It can not, there are other needs uh, that are all identified by our capital planning and our master plans, uh, but this is committed to this priority of fixing the roof and replacing the HVAC units for greater efficiency. Um, given success from the Mass School Building Authority, uh, we would immediately pay down the principal further so to further reduce the exposure that all the towns would have same thing would be true of the rebates all right uh the mass school building authority and i asked them the percentage of reimbursement would not respond to that question okay uh, so we didn't want to offend them because we want them to approve the project uh because they don't know that's all right uh and they always reimburse only that which they consider to be eligible so uh, in the last three accelerated repair projects, we did not have anything that was deemed to be not eligible for the reimbursement uh, as as uh, available. Uh, on the timetable, uh, we also inquired with the Mass School Building, can you give us any sense, because our communities would like to know, when will we know about the approval? They said uh, August at best, okay? So it's almost the next school year that they would entertain. Uh, they had a very short window. Uh, of opening, and they also reopened called the, the core program, which is for major new schools. We follow that because we noticed that five of the regional vocational technical schools, including the one just on the road in Franklin, were quite successful in their communities in securing 300 million or more new construction projects. Uh, we applied them and we can congratulate them. We're not jealous of that. Okay, uh, our building 65 years old. We continue to take care of it. I invite anyone who'd like to see it or tour it. Let me know. We'll, we'll provide that tour. And a number of people have responded to that invitation, including uh, visitors today, from, frankly, from Bellingham. Okay? Um, so the. Uh, uh, in any case, we, we work hard to protect your investment uh, and we're we're chipping away at continuing to improve what you have versus asking for a major surge of money. Uh, we also recognize that the communities are dealing with the uh, the uh, ending of stimulus money, APA and ESSER and others uh, that was help, help communities to a degree, uh, but was not a permanent funding source. We're, we're sad to see some of the communities that are witnessing extreme loss of choice money and stimulus money and now in a bit of a financial panic. Okay, uh, but we're not in that situation because we weren't dependent upon those sources. The other activity here is there's a brief summary on the bottom that I trust indicates that uh, some of the factors uh, that we are attempting to share. Is this helpful, Michael, to answering some of those questions that existed? Yeah, no, I mean, the, I, th I think the questions I had was the mechanism and the the term to understand whether or not we can absorb it in, in future budget cycles. And I was good with the information David provided, so yeah. Yeah, let me also point out, because the question has surfaced elsewhere, and I appreciate your you know flexibility and cooperation. Um, we moved expeditiously to be eligible for the Mass School Building Authority. And so that's why we're asking for annual town meeting action for FY25. Uh, but we're not expecting to borrow any sooner than FY26, okay? And so we know the project's not going to move that fast. That concerns us as far as the condition of the roof. But nevertheless, uh, we don't want to wait any longer. So yeah. so the section of this roof uh, is uh, over the uh, manufacturing areas, culinary areas, the, uh, the restaurant areas, uh, and the uh, engineering programs. And so what's under the roof is very significant in the sense of the, the, the need to protect it with, you know, kind of heating units and things of that nature. So it's uh, not all roofs are the same kind of argument there. And so uh, we did three roof projects by not asking you or any of the other 12 towns for any money. We, we did a passbook loan. To, we, look, we put up the money. We applied to the state. It made it very convenient because we said to the state, we don't have to wait to see what happens with the town. We have the money because of our of what was available for excess and deficiency, which is our free cash account, uh, and uh, we'll pay for it and then apply. And then we received the reimbursement timely uh, and then replenished like 50 cents on a dollar. And so, and that's a process. We, unfortunately, the 60,000 square feet of roof, which is in this project, is not obviously not a not a small project. And so we're not, we don't have the ability to, to do it in that manner. Um, 
in the presentations of the finance committees and others, public hearing, things like that, at this juncture, no one has voiced opposition to the project. Okay. I don't know if that's considered to be, you know, full support. I mean, Question? So do, so you, do all of the member communities need to vote to support this in order for to get the grant? Is it? No, two thirds. Two thirds. Oh. Okay. It, okay. It, okay. That goes back to the original agreement language that was put together. The partnership that you entered into with twelve other towns sixty-five years ago. Great, okay. Thank you. Yeah, which is obviously easier, but not That's that easy. easy. Yeah. So I, I think. I mean, this is a reality we're in. I mean, whether it's. Laxman Valley, Menden Upton, our town buildings. This is the type of stuff we have to start planning for, which we've started to plan for. So I have no issues with the project itself. I am kind of curious, is there a, uh, a more extensive capital plan on, that you could share with us so we can start? Because we started to look five, six years out on our own side. What we're trying to do is overlay uh, the school needs, both regional districts, yes. capital planning perspective. So if you have a more extensive capital plan you could share, That'd be we really could. Uh, the the uh, capital planning committee, which was building on the master plan that was originally put together, identified uh, you know a good forty million dollars worth of projects. We just thought that was a little too ambitious, and it was scary. Okay, and so that what we wanted to say that forty million. <laughs> yeah, well, but it's also not not expected anything would be accomplished in a given year. Okay. No, but. but y y Understood. I'm just more look. It's more information from the town side, so we can overlay with our own capital plan and just understand what the the big the holistic picture looks like for the taxpayer from our from our state. So, if there's something you could share, that'd be great. We're glad to do that. Okay, and so I can respond to the number because I know other things that that were put aside uh, until. Um, so this was the priority. Let's focus on this. This also had reimbursement associated with it, uh, at least a chance of it, and so it it seemed to make sense to advance this in a phase in. Uh, and, uh, and so well, we can we can share that. Okay, so and, and the the amortization. This is if you if we get no reimbursement from the state. This is the top line number. It, it, yes, uh, but we certainly hope we get the rebates Understood. and other things. That's correct. Yeah. This is the level of exposure. Each town has its portion. And your question via the town manager was, I hope I answered with a 6.4, matches this number. Okay. Uh, and um, so the difference for us is what's good for Menden is you have 12 other partners paying 94%. OK, and so um, that's easier for some of the communities that have to bear 100 percent of a roof project. Uh, and so um, that's that's a benefit of the partnership. Yep. OK, All right. again, OK, but uh, we certainly have no objection advancing uh, a more complete capital plan uh, and in doing our best to uh, target at the timetable of the capital plan. But when the only request we have is this one at, yep. for FY. Understood. Yeah. Um, so the the budget books are the standard you know package that's put together. So you do okay, fine. Thanks so much. So the first one is the first, if I may. Okay, I'm kind of doing this in summary, then working to the specifics, if you will. Okay. Old people act like this, but I'm saying um, the first is the cover of the that was designed by our students. What, what we regularly do is is in, in encourage our students to be part of the learning process, and they're very creative, as you can see. This projects like this have have real meaning, uh, and also the students use this in portfolios and, and an opportunity to compete. So, uh, if you turn the pages with me, the budget subcommittee is a cross section of school committee members, which two of whom I've mentioned, who are present in the audience, the independent treasurer who works for the school committee, uh, and uh, and administrative personnel. So, presentations are made by uh, you know vocational directors and special ed directors. Each as every, each one comes through, athletic director, uh, each makes their pitch uh, and defines and, and justifies. What we have seen though is that. It's more common now that people, the presenters have noticed that the budget subcommittee is more receptive when the presenter can indicate what they've done to try to acquire the item without putting it in the budget. Okay, not going without it, but just finding another way to acquire it. 
Uh, so it's it's a very you know, practical approach uh, and it's appreciated. My standard budget letter is the next page. The budget letter uh, is my way of highlighting some of the major changes. Uh, it also inco incorporates some of the things that have been accomplished. Uh, for example, the school committee successfully negotiated uh, a three-year contract with the teachers without legal representation. Uh, there have been no grievances uh, throughout the year. Again, we're pleased to see that. Uh, we're, you know, we pray for that, if you will. Okay, it shows the the harmony and the relationship, respectful relationships. And you already saw some of the attendance rate. Uh, there are 180 students uh, who under special needs, and uh, we continue, uh, including to to monitor closely this the way the state reports our so-called target populations. We have some disagreements with the state in the sense of, in some cases, they consider economically disadvantaged students in the eighth grade, but somehow as they transfer to the ninth grade, their economic disadvantage disappears, okay? And so uh, that's not maturation, and that's uh, it really doesn't make a lot of sense. Uh, but in any case, uh, we continue to respond to the target population's as strategies for recruiting. One of the things you see here is that um, we have a five-year placement study. It's been, it's been more meaningful, Instead of looking at one-year placement, look at five-year placements. At this point, many of the students decide to further their education. They're encouraged by employers who subsidize scholarships and other things to further their education for a, a, a talented workforce. But then they end up in employment. Okay, and so 97% uh, of the 2016 graduates uh, resp responded uh, I think 262 of them responded to the survey uh, and they indicated that they were gainfully employed uh, and that their education at Valley Tech made a difference in their, pre preparing them for life. 62% were directly in the trades, okay? which is a higher percentage than you see both in response to a survey and most cases are that number. Um, it's interesting, many of the students find themselves in related trade areas, okay? It's kind of spin-offs, but still are gainfully employed and, and make contributions to their community. Uh, we participated in a, in a study with the uh, electric company. Um, I worked for them many years ago uh, in doing an analysis of uh, how to save money. And so they, they oftentimes, different companies approach us. You can have a software company that says, we want to field test this new software. Okay, and before we review it, fine tune it, remove some of the bugs. Can we use, can we implement it at your school? That's a, that's a great learning experience for our students and our staff. The staff complete professional development in the amount of 120 hours, every, no less than 120 hours every two years. We want the staff to continue elevate their skill sets to be uh, on target. We also use advisory committees to who are uh, meetings were held uh, earlier t this evening uh, to uh, continue to educate and make our staff aware of new techniques, new approaches, new tools, uh, and new components of the trades. So it's it's all intended to continue to create, not be stale, continue to, to incorporate new techniques. Um, there are 17 more students in the total school population. Okay, most school systems are witnessing a decline. We don't have that. Okay, the green sheet, questions so far? Thank you. Uh, so the green sheet is the revenue sheet, which sometimes people zero in on that almost with the same vigor that they look at the, the assessment page. Uh, I mentioned previously the state aid, very limited, somewhat disappointing, uh, but nevertheless, uh, reality. Uh, you, you uh, Menden wisely joined uh, into two regional systems. Uh, they're fully capable of speaking for themselves. And I recognize my colleagues they are coming up later this evening when I rush over to Upton to make a presentation. Uh, but one of the benefits of the partnership that you have with multiple communities uh, is you receive Chapter 71, known as regional transportation. That is significantly higher than a community that does not have a regional partnership. Uh, and at least the state honors that. Previously, the reimbursement rate was quite strong. Uh, I'm not sure what others are doing, but we're using it like an 80 percent, not using a number as high as we did a year ago, because we can see the way that things are going. Um, one of the things you notice here is a year ago, we received kind of a windfall in regional transportation. That's the other funding source. We have a stabilization account. Uh, limited and focused on uh, transportation, uh, and we're expected to apply that the very next year. So we we got the windfall last year, very next year, 
we can make up some of the loss of Chapter 70 revenue by using the Chapter 71 additional revenue in the amount of 280000 And that, that was a, a savior, if you will. And so the 3.9 budget in total, which is down in the right-hand column, uh, was able to be offset by that revenue. Okay, so if you will, uh, back of the green page, uh, as I mentioned, uh, communities use free cash. Uh, the uh, regional school systems use excess and deficiencies. Uh, in some cases, stabilizations. Uh, the uh, I, I do. If you did notice, initially we had proposed the consideration for your warrant, an additional stabilization plan, but we found there were too many questions by some of the communities, as that as they, they there wasn't a clear understanding by them of stabilization for the community versus stabilization for a region, and so. Because the $10 million project was so vital and so such a high priority of the capital planning, we said, hold on, we'll withdraw that, we'll rescind it, okay? Uh, when a regional school advances a warrant article, if you don't take action in a sufficient time, it becomes automatically approved. It was never my intent to the school committee to squeeze play, to, to force it. So when we saw questions or the need to take it back, provide more uh, background information. You got to keep in mind, the budget comes out end of January, the state opens that window for MSBA, the budget is de designed, warrants close, all different dates across 13 towns. So you get a lot of things happening at once. Uh, that, and so um, we did not want to advance something if confusion existed, not by us, but by those who have to act on it. So we rescinded, the school committee took action to rescind the uh, stabilization account and we took it off the warrant. That matches what you're doing, I hope. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, so, uh, nevertheless, our, our certified excess, excess and deficiency certified by the Department of Revenue, it can't be spent or used until it's certified by the Department of Revenue. And even then, it must be acted upon in public posted session by the school committee uh, uh, to draw from it. And so, we're asking, uh, making the communities aware that we may draw up to 750 uh, of the 1.1 million. It's a little dangerous when you go that deep into that reserve, uh, but it only, it's only permission to spend. It's not really a guarantee that we'll spend. Um, you may know that uh, the state law permit a 5% maximum, which in our case would be 400,000 more than what we have in the excess and deficiency account. Any questions on that? So if you're if you're diving that deep into e &D, you must have a quick replenishment view ahead of it, right? Uh, say that again. So if you're going to dive that deep into your E&D, I'm assuming you have a plan to be able to replenish that well, quickly. Well, we, we've we been able, we'll do everything we can to replenish it. Yeah. And one of the ways we replenish are the grants. Yeah. In other words, you have something that's needed to say special education services, okay? Uh, and then uh, you, you're successful in enhancing the grant to bring in that so that you could then, that frees up the money from the budget that was approved. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So the answer is yes. Uh, we've we've regularly targeted. I will point out that when I started as just vocational superintendent 31 years ago, the E and D account was zero, <laughs> so it wasn't replenished. It didn't exist. Okay. And so different level of. I'm not criticizing my predecessor. He felt he had to use whatever he had. Okay. Uh, and so, but yes, we've done that. If you look at 31 years, you'll see we've consistently replenished, but we replenished it not by overbuilding the towns, but by initiating other savings, asking our own staff to do projects and things of that nature. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. So uh, the next sheet is the uh, budget breakout. Uh, I previously mentioned sheet. that and the summary sheet allowed you to Dr. focus on Dr. that. A quick yes. Question. So you're, this is stating that there may be a need to tap 750,000 V and D for, for things that are not included in the budget, correct? That's correct. And then this, the, the second last paragraph on that same page is basically ex sort of describing what those potential uh, projects might be, the capital. That's, correct. That's also expected. They haven't been identified, but you foresee that there's some capital uh, projects that are not in the budget, but you're, you're, you may be tapping E&D to do some things. We hope not. Okay, in other words, what we hope is that, once again, the 10 million allows us to move forward with the highest emergency, right. and that's outside of this. Yeah. Okay, you can see, what, hopefully we secure your support to do that. Uh, if you don't support us, then it doesn't make a difference what Masco building already does. Okay, um, so, uh, but this is intended to define how we might use it, permission or transparency of how it's used, uh, and, and um, with hopefully limited use of it. What would the process be 
to if you choose to act on the 750 I and mean, more edification for me is what is the process for the school committee i am guessing to identify and authorize the use so you identify the project you say we don't have it here we need to hit the e and d money we've got permission to use so what does that process look like and how would a taxpayer understand what it you know, when is that decision made and what are the projects that it's going to be used for? Sure, I'll give you an example. Uh, we approached Milton Cat for the donation of uh, simulation equipment. It's, it's very elaborate, allowing us to offer a hoisting license. So we needed a, a room to, to host that donated equipment to us. Uh, and so we, we hired using E&D money in the summer, okay, uh, a retired carpentry teacher, and we hired the students. Uh, the, the, the presentation was made to the school committee would like to re reconfigure, do our own renovation work to convert a section of the building so that we can add uh, and store uh, and operate the hoisting equipment donated by uh, South Fork Milton or Milton Cat. Uh, that was an example of how you would draw. So the school committee would hear that rationale. Uh, they would include it in the agenda. A vote would be taken on summer project X, okay? Uh, and uh, we'd have the benefit of knowing the, the personnel cost and the material cost, uh, and then a school committee school committee would look at the merits of that, yep. and then uh, and they supported it. So we built the room. So through normal channels, the school committee meetings, which are available for public viewing, for the people that are listening to this meeting and they're hearing seven hundred fifty thousand being allocated, but to what, and they're not sure. The idea is that if you're if you're interested, there is a mechanism to to follow all the progress BVT is making and how that money is being allocated. Yes, this is the first bomb of that transparency to indicate that that it's like up to not yep. necessarily to spend. Yep. Uh, and then, yes, but it's voted. Uh, it's in uh, you're going to uh, a, a citizen or anyone interested. Uh, first of all, they could come to the meeting, watch it on Zoom uh, and um, they no longer televise it because they think it lost its luster, if you will, for TV shows. I'm sure that people watch this one, but they went to what you know, uh, but in any case, um, the um, we offered to the towns that indicated an interest that if they wanted to videotape, come on over. And for a while, a few a couple towns did that. Okay, but yes. Uh, so the the town meeting, sorry, the school committee agenda itself posted at least 48 hours in advance for open meeting law uh, would in, would indicate such actions as well. Okay. Yep. And the minutes, the minutes would also, of course, the minutes are after something happens, not before. But yeah. Okay. Um, the other groups that look at this, we have a school council that approves it. There's, you know, not just a full school committee, public hearing. I'm going to, I'll go walk you through the process as we get through the next few pages. Uh, the town by town breakout is listed here. I've already indicated to you that um, the, uh, let me point out that Menden has 5.9%, uh, just under 6% of the ownership of the school. However, the bond is based on a three-year average of enrollment. And so uh, that's, again, back to the, the original agreement and uh, answering your question, that's 6.4. So that's the difference between the two numbers, okay? Moving What's on. The year on year reduction of uh, students from Menden. From Menden? Yeah, from last year to this uh, year. Okay. Uh, the FY22 minus three, FY23 plus seven, FY24 plus eight, FY25 minus 10. Okay, there's your there's your range. That that answer that? Yep. Okay. All right. So the next few sheets are the individual breakouts uh, in the line item budget of the state with uh, rationales provided for each section uh, to say, and the total tally is a reduction uh, of Menden of $128,142. Okay. The um, the last few pages are, um, are really summary pages of the process to show that as multiple steps over several months uh, all these meetings are posted reviewed by uh, you know multiple people okay uh, there are times when we've had observers uh, and or people and also sometimes graduate students uh, who are you know completing graduate work or you know dissertations or, or studying uh, and and they they want to watch our process we're glad to have them okay whether they're ours or, or someone else's so No, not yet. It will be next week. 
OK, so what we like to do is I'm already committed to the students uh, to be videotaped. We videotape the presentation every year. It's on the website as soon as we do it. But we'd like to get a sense of the town's reactions to see if there are any other changes or tweaking before we share it for the public. So because uh, we respect the view of the public, but it will be uh, we're going to tape it next week. OK, and I spoke with the students in the, the, today. OK, so is that it? OK, so and we've, I've done it 30. 30 times, I guess I'll do it the 31st. So okay. um, that's summary. And all the efforts to pay monies uh, through those grants, that's an impressive statement. Thank you. Uh, we we really value the dollar, OK, uh, and, and, and we recognize um, some of the communities have a very limited, you know, uh, funding source. OK, uh, and so uh, we try to be respectful, even though each community has 12 other partners. Uh, and. Um, you know, I'll just say thank you. So, and we, okay. thank you. I, I'll, I'll see you at town meeting. I've gone to the town meeting every year. So usually somewhere where Mike Amadola can poke fun at me. Oh, so. <laughs> yeah. He's not online, is he? Oh. Are you still still without a quorum? We are still without a couple other side notes. Um, yep. Oh, sorry. Is he out there? No, he's not. Yeah, we are still without quorum. So <laughs> last year, you know, uh, I I made reference to his name about three quarters of the way through the presentations, and then I. I'm not saying he woke up, but then he popped on the screen, which was kind of funny for the first time. And so I said, somebody must have said, Mike, Mike, <laughs> it's your opening. So, uh, you know, two side notes. I noticed that the uh, Lions Club made a presentation earlier. Our students are very active in the Lions Club, uh, in the Leo Clubs and Lions Club. Um, the um, we recently made a uh, eyeglass drop box, OK, uh, for Alliance Lions Club, OK, to, uh, designed by students in a special project. Uh, and it's on the uh, North Smithfield border, uh, which is where it was positioned by the Fernandez, uh, that, that uh, supermarket there. Okay. In addition, uh, Menden is one of uh, six towns that it participates in the regional animal rescue program. OK, uh, and so you may know that. Uh, and our school is uh, working with uh, uh, Mr. Sullivan, the, the uh, animal rescue person uh, for the six towns uh, in a design project of the building initially. Uh, then it probably needs some architectural stamps and then uh, we hope to also build it. OK, well, you we'll have to pay for the materials. OK, uh, uh, but so these are great projects meaningful for our students, not just Eagle Scout projects, but we have 10 Eagle Scouts this year alone. OK, uh, but that uh, and I say that because uh, we've been very. We've enjoyed the affiliation association with so many people from Menden who have promoted scouting. OK, but nevertheless, uh, these are projects which the students include in their own portfolios, use it for scholarships, use it for college, use it for job entry and feel good about what they've done for their communities. It's real meaningful stuff. So, we should the best in your town manager search. Thank you so much for coming. I think but, uh, they put we, the question about uh, Providence. Yeah, do we think that is short? Or to that so John, do you see this as a five to ten minute topic or do you see it as longer? Five minutes. Five minutes. All right. If if that is all right with our next budget presentations then OK. OK, all right. So uh, yes, we will then jump. Jump to item. Nine or sorry, eight, sorry. Item eight, discuss Providence Street and we could invite uh, John Dudley, our um, highway surveyor. So as we know, Providence is a uh, ongoing problem. It did flood again this weekend and caused us to shut the road down for a little over 24 hours. Um, there's really, we need to fix it. Like there's no, 
we don't have time to wait for grant funding. I've done a lot of research in the past few days talking to different contractors because I know when I spoke to you guys last, we were talking about the highway department as doing it ourselves and not going out to uh, have anybody else come in. But there was some apprehension from some of the guys on the department because it's such a big project that they've never done before. Uh, they were concerned about it. So I started talking to contractors and uh, basically said to them, what can you, if you come in with your machine and do the heavy lifting of this project and we help you, we help you move material around, we help you do this project, what's it looking like? Um, right now, we're probably looking at $100,000 to get this project finished. That is, that does include the generous uh, donation from Kimball's who said they would donate all of the material to fix the road, the stone, the gravel, whatever we need, they will donate it at no cost. Um, that would get us three uh, five foot diameter pipes across the road um, and replace the culverts that are there. We're looking at if we can secure the funding, we're looking at the April vacation week so that there's no school buses and we're probably looking at a week and a half to two weeks total, but starting that project school vacation week. So I know in the past there's been a conversation about giving $250,000 to highway from ARPA and I'm hoping that we can use 100,000 of that or hopefully not go over 100,000, but maybe push it to 125 just to be safe so that we can get this done quick. Is the extra five foot volume enough? Is that? So we have one uh, pipe. We have one pipe down there that's operating at about 10% right now. Okay. So adding it, we get three pipes going that five, five foot volume will be more than enough. Yeah, so John, you, you have $50,000 allocated to engineering costs for this project. Is that needed still? It is not. We I spoke with Mass DOT on Monday when they came out after the uh, road flooded and they told us that it's our project. We can do what we need to do to fix it and we don't have to engineer it if we don't want to. Now we talked about a box culvert that requires engineering. That is a, I, I explored that option and it is significantly more, more money for the box culvert as opposed to the pipe. And then you're talking footings and head walls and all kinds of stuff to go with it. So it's a big, much bigger cost. I, I don't know enough to actually understand all everything you just said, but you're $50,000 in the bank right now. We'd have to probably vote to reallocate it since yep. we allocated to engineering. The other thing is within would chapter 90 be available for this use? Because I think you actually have a balance of, in chapter 90, regardless of supplemental funding we've talked about. I think the part that I'm pretty sure we could use for chapter 90 is the paving portion. We're gonna be paving about a 250 foot stretch of Providence Road to button this project up. And we could probably at least take the funding from chapter 90 for that. Also, we do still have money in our hired equipment and um, road materials budget that can help towards this as well. We can always replenish after the fact. I mean, it's not, what, what I want to make sure is money should not be slowing this effort down. No, not at all. Right. Yeah. Do we do we need to take a vote to reallocate ARPA from an engineering project to for, for Providence? I, I think just to memorialize it, you should. OK, yeah. So well, so I would. In, no. I would like to understand more about the actual calculations behind whether three five foot diameter culverts are actually appropriate. I, I don't know what the flow rate of the of I don't know enough about environmental engineering to be able to guess what happens when uh, that flash flood happens. I don't know what it means for uh, future considerations as things possibly get worse. Yeah, it sounds great, but as an engineer, not having done the math and then just doing it that sounds dangerous to me. I would much rather, I'd feel much more comfortable knowing that somebody with some sort of engineering background did some sort of calculations to validate the flow rates through so, there. So you're suggesting that we should proceed with the engineering, which is going to provide three separate approaches to fixing the problem. 
I would like to figure out some way to get at least some other professional input on it, whether that's through mass DOT. I mean, if, if DOT just sort of said, you guys do whatever you want hands off, like, do we have any sort of input from any other professionals that I do about I'm actually I'm, I do and I'm actually looking it up right now. Um, just um, I received an email when I reached out to uh, L and L concrete about box culverts and they told me that um, the design data publications for American Concrete Pipe Association says the flow capacity of the existing twin five foot diameter pipes is approximately 230 cubic feet per second. Uh, we were looking to replace it with an eight by three culvert, which would have put us at 310 cubic feet per second. So if we do the math and we're adding another pipe, we're looking at another 115 cubic feet per second, and we would be up to uh, 345 cubic feet per second, which would be more than the culvert box culvert that we were looking at. So the engineering that needed to be done was more about the engineering of installing. So the engineering, size. the engineering for for a box culvert, it absolutely needs to be engineered. There's got to be footings poured, and uh, there's a whole greater deal that goes into this. Uh, it would also, if we chose to do grant funding, we would have to have it engineered. Uh, where we're doing kind of an in-kind replacement and adding a third pipe that we don't have to do the engineering. It's certainly an option if we decide we want to, but engineering takes time. There's like a 10x increase in flow from the current rate is the math. Yeah. On the, on the map. Yeah, that's fine. <laughs> um, and just, just real quick note, John, we, we've kind of parked any sort of grant approach for this particular problem many I mean, we're not talking of grants for this the other culverts potentially around town yes yeah. but this yeah. one providence street we're not think we should be talking about grants because we to, we're talking but we've, construction we've next this. year mm -hmm. we're, yeah, we're so talking i live on the bad side year. of providence when this happens so i am very personally <laughs> apt to get this fixed yeah. i don't want to invest the money and then all of a sudden uh, you know, it wasn't able to handle what we what it wasn't able to handle the flow rate that it needed because we didn't calculate everything out and we just sort of, you know, redneck engineered it. Um, and I want to make sure that that doesn't happen. So, yes, those calculations seem OK. So um, I agree. I want to see the job done right. Yeah. <laughs> what I want to do is make sure from yeah. this board standpoint is make sure the monies are in place for. The professionals out there that know this work. Yeah. to do their job but i agree it should i'm assuming we're doing taking all the right steps yeah. i personally don't know what all those steps are i'm going to rely on highly surveyor to identify the best approach forward and, and but i wanted to make sure as we allocate funds make it available so he can start that process to yeah. do it the right way yeah so and just a reminder i think john maybe you can speak to this the the current pipes have failed it's not just that they weren't big enough but they actually yeah they, failed. well right. yeah so i guess the other question is what else about the so you've got one singular large you know box shaped hole and the ability for those things to get plugged again in the event of a water surge uh is there any extra i guess security to make sure that those pipes don't get blocked uh, from debris that ends up going through. I don't know if it, that's also at the end of their 20 year lifespan. So they were constricted by corrosion. Yeah, absolutely. And I can, I've, I have pictures of it. Like I said, one, one is operating at about 50 to 60% and the other one's operating at about 10 right now. Yeah. I mean, really, what, what I'm hearing is good due diligence. Yeah. Right. Yeah. We should do that. That should be a matter of course, right? They're going to do due diligence and think about what happened how do we prevent it going forward right so fair that's fair yeah so my my question is between in his in your current budget john with the allocated funds we already provided for engineering do you have enough to move this forward and get more information more details to further satisfy any questions on what the solution will be so you what I can take that and see if I can get somebody to come out and provide us with the hydraulic hydraulic numbers 
hydrologic numbers that would come with that with that project before we move ahead with um, repairing it. Would if there, that's what if that's time, what we're looking for. Would there be time to do that with your uh, hoped for timeline? Right. Uh, that I would have to look into. I'm going to say that it would probably end up pushing our timeline out. OK, I just don't want funding to be a sticking right. point to move ahead. But I also want us to do it the right way to the extent that we you know, answer the questions people have. And so what, yeah. I, what, I, what I will do tomorrow is I'm going to reach out to the Mass DOT Bridge Department and see if they have anybody that can come out and actually determine that information for us so that we can move forward. And hopefully, if they're willing to come out and do that, it's not going to cost us anything. Yeah, I think that's a good I think that's a good thing to check on. That sounds right. Like a a box culvert and that design was recommended for a reason. I want to make sure that there aren't things we aren't missing. Because none of us are experts in this mm -hmm. of why a box culvert was specifically specified. It could have been, you know, well, OK, it's a nice big project and that's always, you know, I mean, it, it, but it feels like we almost need yeah. to see pros and cons for the solution to make sure that we're, yeah. we're answering the questions we need. Yeah, it's it's not al always obvious and uh, just a bigger hole may not be the right answer, right? So <laughs> um, really big hole. <laughs> how much how much more capacity will currently now versus after it's two pipes to three pipes? Yep. And uh, one pipe's at 50%, one pipe's at 10%. So in terms of flow, how much you had mentioned that I was just. Right, so if I remember the previous numbers, we're going to like 300-ish cubic feet versus right now, one of them's at around 100 and the other one's around. But with thumb in the air, okay, yeah, it seems okay. But like, again, I'm, I don't know enough about environmental engineering to be able to make that assessment of what I should and shouldn't be also thinking about in the reason why that particular design was recommended. So it would be nice. I, if we I do know street. that I knew I do know that one of the things they discussed about a box culvert is that it's stronger with all the trucks that go over that road. I don't necessarily think there was concern about the flow if we added another pipe from mass dot when i talked to them it was more of a structural stronger um option yeah given this so, traffic yeah this is, right. so so this is what i think i don't think there's any impediments to moving forward starting tomorrow and getting answers and getting engaging with the right people john you have funding right and we could even take a memorialized vote to reallocate the engineering right. to general solution if that's the right wording we meet we're meeting every week so if additional funding is needed we do have remaining arpa funds if we need to we could tap on quickly yeah but that what we don't want to do to your point mike is just um not think this through assess options to the point where we're, we're comfortable the solution is in for the long term yeah right yeah does that make sense, John? I mean, I don't think you have yep. an impediment to moving ahead between Chapter 90 and previously allocated funds. So, so let's, let's, let's go. Does anyone want to make a motion to, I guess, reallocate the? I'll make a motion to reallocate the $50,000 we allocated from ARPA to fund tie and bond engineering to um, fund a general solution for Providence Street culvert. Second. Further discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. All right. I think this will be a standing topic. Agenda. So. That's my guess. We'll be doing this again next week, John. It's a little bit more than five minutes. Thanks, John. 15, but thank you so much. I think that, uh, yeah, it's definitely something we need to deal with as yes. much as possible. I think we all agree. Oh, yeah. 100%. <laughs> all right. So next, I would I like to. Uh, Invite uh, MURSD up to present. And if you don't mind introducing yourselves, I know I'm ready. <laughs> Absolutely. For our people viewing at home. Sure. So I'm Maureen Cohen. I'm the superintendent of Men and Upton Regional. And I'm Maureen. Oh, and I'm super. <laughs> Jay Byer, I'm the business manager for the school district. We did send out 
the I don't know if you've got the materials digitally. Yeah, we got uh, a few things. Whole PDF. OK, um, I brought like there are four budget books here. If you wanted it, if anybody likes it. I saw you walk in with that. Good, good reset. Um, they're also all all the okay, same things that we sent you are available on our website on our budget. Page, Wonderful. So you can just access that as well. Yeah. Anticipating my question. <laughs> yeah, it's already there. So you can find it already. And uh, so what we did, we actually had the budget hearing just was that this week? No, that week. was last week. Oh gosh. Okay. So a week ago. And um what we've done, we took a, that's a longer presentation. We just kind of made a copy of it. We did send that to you and then we have some key points we wanted to highlight with you tonight and be able to answer any questions that you may have. Um want to thank Mike for being there at the budget hearing the other day. And also Mike Goddard's been at a lot of our meetings and really thankful for his contributions on multiple boards and committees that we've been uh, participating in. So thank you. Everyone. Yes, and you've been at every school committee. Thank you. Uh, yeah, yeah, so it's been it's it's been really nice to get to know everyone and have you participate and have it be really collaborative. And we had a nice meeting as well. So that I just wanted to begin with that. That's been really helpful in our process. Now we have a presentation to share. Um, yes, I think Jason's there. Oh, I, mean, uh, I just saw the presentation. The new one. I can, I can I'm sure it's the right version from Monday night. Yes, yeah, I got it. You got it here, right? Yeah. Uh, okay, but it's landscape. Well, yeah. I mean, portrait. No, that's the budget book. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. I can share it. I have. Yeah. We have Sorry. a 475 oh. slide presentation. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, then I'm getting a comfy <laughs> chair. <Sorry. laughs> No, we, yeah, I, I sent Jody links for it uh, as it was. she made them in the PDFs. They were a uh, Google slide presentations. Is he, you just sent me them this afternoon, though. Yeah, yeah, after we um, talk. Yeah, OK, yeah. <clears throat> the short I just wasn't logged into the meeting, so I'm just logging into them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't see how we can do that. No, okay, it's print recognition in there. Open, then I can share. Verify it's me. Yep. It's me. It's me. Get it up there. The first slide, slide is really snazzy, so I was just waiting. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> I, mean, I, I always can jump into things, but uh, I feel like it's almost there, right? <laughs> is it? Oh, here it is. I just have to share it. Thanks. Join the meeting, mute myself. Um, Okay. Yay. That is a nice first slide. I saw it for a moment. <laughs> <laughs> so we can go to the next slide. So I'll just tell you when to hit the button if that's all right. Is this okay. Yeah, yeah, that's that's great. Thank you. And again, we will post this version of it on our website after for the. Oh, even better, I can control. That's awesome. 
<laughs> All right, uh, so we want to begin. We always like to begin just to give you a sense of the demographics and the enrollment numbers that we have. Um, so our, at a glance right now, we have uh, 2,072 students enrolled this year. And uh, when we ran a report the other day in all, we have 395 employees that are being paid, and that's a, 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 wide, a wide range of positions throughout the district. And uh, we have about a little over 200 that might fall into what you would say, you know, the teachers, instructional staff, and about 58 paraprofessionals um, that make up that. Uh, we have uh, at the end in the budget book, just to, I'll point out some things if you want to go, there's a lot more information in that book. We do, I've been tracking the demographics over all the years. So towards, I think it might be in the back of the book or under enrollment section, you'll see the the change in demographics over the course of the last, you know, 15 years or so. Um, but this is a snapshot. Also, if anyone's not aware, anything about the school districts you can find on school profiles on the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education website. We have to update that every October, every March, and this data is coming. Let's see. Are you doing know There you go. Down a little down. Yeah. How do I get to the next one? Do you want to drive? I can't see up there. Something else that we do every year, uh, we work with an organization called the New England School Development Council, and they do historical and projected enrollments for us. And what they do is they mostly look at birth rates. Um, they kind of track it over the years. So look if there's housing developments. Um, what I like, about, there's many in the budget book and the back of the presentation, we have lots of the various charts that they do for us. This happens to be one of my favorite ones because it tracks the fact when people say your enrollment's going down over the years. The last 10 years, it has been going down just like it has in many similar communities uh, to ours. And we're kind of, we're at that midpoint and it's it's projected to keep going up to the same um, numbers in the next 10 years as well. Now, they track it every year. That could change year to year. These are not 100% exact numbers because they're just projections, but uh, it's something that we monitor and we monitor enrollment. Um, I do it monthly. I, you know, get updates all the time just to track how many are coming in at different grade levels from different towns as well. Next slide. Thanks. Um, I never want to talk about a budget without first talking about what it's all supporting and what it's for, and it's our students and our mission of the fact that we empower all learners to thrive. And when we're talking about the investment requests and we're, we're talking about the various aspects of the budget, it all goes directly to support our students and your students in Menden and students in Upton as well. So always like to start with that. Keep going. This is definitely my shortened version of my presentation. Uh, something else that we wanted to make sure all the communities were aware is the fact that we're in our first year of our next strategic plan. So we really are driven by our strategic plan. And on the right you have, on the left you have, I just took a couple snapshots of this. You can also see it on our website, or if you want a hard copy, we have it in our office. I'm more than happy to send it over. Um, you can see our theory action, theory of action, but our strategic priorities that are on the right, right, that's what drives our goals and our actions in action steps that we work towards every single year. So when we look at our investment requests and we look at our priorities, we're really connecting it back to our strategic priorities as well as one of the categories. And I'll, I'll speak to this after. Um, but we've had a, a long-term focus on deeper learning. Um, you might hear things like project-based learning or um, Project Lead the Way with science, I, all of these are connected back to this deeper learning goal. We also have high quality curriculum instruction, focus on equity, inclusion, and um, diversity, and well being, and also the wellness. Well, we have put a lot of supports in the last number of years post pandemic to support our students and also the community support. Um, so, different um, focus on communications, capital planning, um, and lots of other areas as well. I'm not going to go deeply into this chart, but for me, I've found it's been really helpful as a visual 
for people to see our progress through the years. In the middle, you have kind of the, you know, we were on track with our last strategic plan, then COVID, and then we've been in recovery. Um, and then now we're launching our new strategic plan. Some, I'm not going to go into each one of these, and I'm more than happy at any point to answer any questions. Uh, but this is the work that we've been doing and building upon and focused on. And so we're really focused on some areas that we're proud of are the innovative career pathways uh, for students in computer science right now. That's a designation we got from the state and we're about to get um, also a designation in business and having a business program as well. Um, so we're excited about that. We've had a lot of um, strong focus on literacy and writing, especially after the pandemic, um, because there were such a switch to um, using devices and when students were home that were really realized that the writing skills had declined. And so that's a, a focus, particularly at the elementary level, data inquiry um, of really targeting the needs of our students. That's, we've also been really working on that the last few years to make sure that when students need additional needs, we're targeting those needs. So these are some key areas that uh, we're proud of, of the work that we're doing. On the next slide, uh, when I talk in the hearing, I talk about the journey of the Menden Upton student. And, uh, you know, we talk about some of the work that they do at the elementary and, and middle school. Um, but I also like to highlight some of the outcomes that you see. And uh, this past year was one of the highest that we've had of qualifying scores since 2010. Um, if you take a look at our region and Nipmuc there has 76% qualifying in their advanced placement. So for a smaller school, we have a third of our students, percentage of our students taking AP courses and qualifying, um, getting qualifying scores, which helps them in college and, and shows how well pre prepared they are. We have lots of other indicators that are shared in the budget book that you can take a look at of our successes of our students. And uh, we don't only focus on a, these achievement letters. We do focus on the experiences that our students are getting, and we have an internship program that we're launching as well this year. We really heavily focus on portrait of a learner and various competencies that they need and um, making a lot of community connections so we're really proud of all the work that we're doing with that. You know, sometimes people want to see some of the numbers of achievement. So this is just one snapshot to share. So as we go into the next, you can click it again, the next slide. I uh, always like to begin with the budget development cycle. And to point out, I know you are all well aware because you go through a very similar process, I'm sure, in, in budget development. Uh, but it isn't, it may feel like a lot right now when we have all of our presentations and we're getting the information from the state, et cetera. But um, we, it is a year long process for us. So even though we just presented our, our budget just the other day, it is already probably changing in the last week with different information and, and elements that are come up as well. Your assessment doesn't change, just so you know, but <laughs> so but that's just so you know that, but um, it is ongoing and we make decisions every day and every week related to the budget um, and it's a collaborative process. On the next slide, I also just want to point out, I'm not going to go through all of these, but on our website, every single one of our budget presentations minutes from our meetings, presentations at budget subcommittee. So if you are unable to attend any of our meetings, our school committee meetings are, you know, live. You can come in person, which we always welcome, uh, but you can also see it live as well if you, you want to see any of that. And we post all the presentations related to the budget here. So I want to point that out as many that we are really trying to be focused on being transparent and communicating all throughout. Um, so there aren't any surprises. This past year, we began our conversations with budget goals and our three main areas were related to continued high quality programs and instruction for our students. Um, so we are focusing on sustaining class size numbers in our programs um, at the current standards that they're at. We also are continuing with what's called MTSS or multi-tiered systems of support. We've talked a lot about that after the pandemic, and that is really supporting all of the needs of our students academically, social, emotionally, and behaviorally, and focusing on their well-being as well. And that has included additional PD, staff support, um, additional resources in the last number of years. We, again, our focus on being future ready and having our students um, 
focus on deeper learning experiences, being um, exposed to Portugal learner competencies, et cetera. Uh, this is my favorite chart. Um, <laughs> and what I like about it is I'd like to show all of the factors that go into our budget prioritization and know that what we're thinking about what benefits are the community members. So, you know, if you're you know, here around the table or your parents in the community or anyone, what are you looking for and expecting from your local schools? We also want to think about what resources do we need for that and then what challenges we're facing. And so when we seek feedback, either through strategic planning or focus groups or surveys, whatever, you know, people sharing with us what their priorities are, uh, the top is the community expectations that have been shared with us and also uh, just below it are their district and school strategic goals. All of our school goals, professional goals are all aligned to our strategic plan and district plan. And then we look at our resources and we have to make sure we maintain our student support service delivery that's mandated. We can't suddenly not have curricular resources for students, um, you know, and most of them unfortunate, fortunately and unfortunately are, di are digital. And uh, in the past you could buy a textbook and you might have that for, you know, 30 years. I don't recommend that either, um, but with the digital, it's a subscription for three to five years and you have to renew it. And sometimes if you're talking about all of elementary, that can be really costly because it's two schools and it's everyone. Um, if it's maybe one course, it's not as expensive, um, but we have that is something that we have to sustain as well as our tech infrastructure. When the Wi-Fi goes down for a minute, I mean, that disrupts, I'm sure you understand how it disrupts if it happens to us and all the learning that's taking place. So we have to maintain that as well. And um, operations building grounds are a, a big part for us as well. But we also really do and have been working on the financial considerations. Uh, I spoke to the cooperation that we've had um, with all of you and really appreciate that uh, we're trying to um, have our short term goals and also think about the long term goals and in where how we can get there. Um, and we know that there's limited town revenues that we are working with. Dr. Fitzpatrick talked about the reduced state aid. That's impacting us. We'll talk about that in a minute. Fixed costs, et cetera. Um, so this all comes together when we're thinking about our priorities. The other thing we think about is how we start at the bottom and I've had this chart different iterations of it the last few years. So hopefully it's starting to be familiar. But what I added on the right was the fact that it's an understanding of level service budget needs base, more strategic, more competitive. Ideally, we want to be the most competitive district around. At least that's me as superintendent, right? You know, we want people to <coughs> have whatever opportunity that our students can have coming out of our district, right? And, but that would take a lot of money, you know, and we know that. So we have strategic investments at times and programs we try to sustain things. Last year, we were at that upper green um, line there of level services where we had level services and we addressed a couple critical needs and a couple strategic investments. This year, the way the budget is at, and we'll speak to that in a moment, we are at the, the lower level service line. We're on the cusp of reducing services. We are not currently reducing services, but we are at the cusp. Um, and we'll talk about why we're there. Um, it, that does not mean, I just want to be clear, it, that doesn't mean that if there's a critical need, we won't you know, get if it's a mandated need, but we will always fulfill that. But then that's we have to make, you know, choices of what we're uh, reducing elsewhere. In the budget book, I have a different type of outline related to investment requests and kind of a history of it. Um, and you can go deeper into all the departmental requests. They come forward. I ask them to present what they think is what we need for strategic investments, um, critical needs, et cetera. And so they come forward and they present that. When they do so, we know that we don't have the funds in order to um, meet all of those needs every year, but I want it to be front and center so everyone in the community were transparent about the needs we're talking about, and they change. Sometimes things change over the years. Uh, right now, where we're at in the budget, we have are covering everything in that level services. Um, if we have enough, numbers for Spanish immersion, and that's at both schools. Um, 
we've been building out to have a strand at each of the schools. If so, then we'll for we'll need another teacher for that. Um, but we ha also have some approaching critical needs in related to therapeutic programming, which we added at the elementary school last year. Um, but some of the students are are soon to be up at the middle school. The next one we wanted to fill was the therapeutic um, program supports at the middle school as well. Um, if we have those in place, it is possible that we wouldn't have students going out of district because we'd be meeting their needs in district, and that's um, always going to be better for students. And so you can see some of the ex <coughs> other examples of things that have been asked for. Um, last year we put in uh, an investment increase in our tech line in order uh, technology. Um, a lot of our devices has never been in our budget, which is kind of wild, but we had a lot of grants in the past where we got our original devices and they're not really available. A lot of them are COVID related, so we need to actually have in our budget because technology really is a utility. So we put part of that for a lease renewal and um, we are we're unable to put it in in this this year's budget. That was one of our strategic investments that we need but couldn't meet. Um, so we head to the bottom line and the bottom line is um, if you start at the top there, we had about 11 new positions, um, which is obviously most of like a, a request and increases that were requested. We went through, approved just the one right now and um, to date and made reductions in lots of the other requests and our estimated revenue that Jay will talk about in a minute. You can see where that's at, which led us a couple weeks ago to a shortfall of a little over a million dollars. Uh, when we went to the budget hearing a week ago for um, to certify the budget, we and we'll talk about it now how we've made some of the reductions. So we're just you know you're aware of the movements that we've had to make. Ready? Me? Yep. Yep. All right. Go All right. So We'll first start off with the expenditure side, just so you can see how the budget splits out. Between employee benefits and employee salaries, it's about 76% of our budget goes to people and personnel. Um, about 5% goes to out of district tuition for special ed. About 6% goes to transportation. We got 5% for maintenance and a little over 8% for instructional supplies. Now, instructional supplies includes technology, computers, laptops, curriculum, you know, pens, pencils, any of those kind of things that play into it. Um, the point of this is that, you know, 76% goes to just the people that work in the district. Um, key drivers. So we're in negotiations with all of our associations right now. So what we did is we put money into a, what we call reserve for negotiations, and we basically level funded all of the salary lines with the exception of steps and lanes because those are contractual. So, but we've got a little under 1.5 million as an increase for salaries. Our health insurance, which I'll talk about a little bit in the future, you know, a couple, of, you know, a couple of minutes from now. We initially got a quote of 12 and a half percent. We were working on a different option for that, but that was a 535,000 hour increase. Worcester retirement. I know the town got a similar increase. It's been like 10 percent a year. Seems like forever. Um, Medicare, obviously, if your payroll goes up, your Medicare taxes go up. Maintenance, we've got some building maintenance issues that we need to address. Uh, you know, our buildings, they look new when you drive by them. They look like brand new shiny schools, but Nipmuc is 27 years old and Clefton Memorial are just about 20 years old. And things tend to start to break down after 20 years, just like in your house, and there's things you have to get fixed. Transportation is a con contractual thing. It's up about 79000 the technology piece that you see an increase in, we took out the 200,000 we hope to fund for iPads, but this is for switches, servers, basically the infrastructure stuff. A lot of that equipment, again, was aging out and had to be replaced. We do it through leases, you know, not leases, we finance it out over like a four year period, but we had an increase there as well. Um, just so you can see some of the drivers in a more of a chart type basis, you know, our, we use something this year called CAGR, which, basically gives you a sort of an annualized growth rate. Um, so salaries over the last five years are up a little about about 2.8%. So that includes COLA, steps, lanes, and everything. Um, health insurance, it was zero in FY22, but we got 8% the last two years, and they're saying 12 and a half, but we've got some options that we'll talk about in a second. Transportation goes up about 4% a year. Now, this doesn't is not just 
uh, regular ed. This includes special ed. In special ed transportation, the costs have increased dramatically. Uh, where we used to sometimes pay, you know, maybe a hundred dollars a day. Now it's looking at three hundred dollars a day for some of these transportation costs. So, and part of it's because they can't get drivers. So that's driving up costs. We're going to go back just on the to show the reimbursement. Oh yeah, that is less. Right, I'm noticing yeah. that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Two, parts, two parts to that. So you'll see blue and green there. Blue is our cost. Green is the reimbursement. So you'll see in a little bit that our transportation reimbursement from the state is being dropped by one hundred eighty thousand dollars. So where they've hovered at the seventy five percent range for reimbursement. This current year it was almost eighty percent. Right now we're down to sixty eight percent for FY twenty five. We hope that that changes as the budget works through the House and the Senate, but as it stands right now, that's the number we have. So that's one area when you know people. What yeah. can we do at the end? And for advocacy, that's one area that when we meet or we send notices to them, um, is this is one area that would be uh, really help us. Call your state reps and senators and tell them to help us. Yeah. Um, Worcester retirement. We don't have to spend a lot of time on, but that's been, you know, over annualized over time. It's a little under seven, over seven and a half percent. Maintenance, again, as I said, some of our maintenance costs continue to go up. And the thing that amazes me is everything that breaks seems to cost twenty thousand dollars at a minimum to fix. It doesn't matter what it is. We've got an issue with the elevator at Nipmuc right now. That's like a forty thousand dollar fix, and you got to have the elevator fixed because you've got to have the ability to get up and down floors. So all these things are tending to add up and things are tired, starting to break down. Um, and then technology, as Maureen said, it's more of a utility now than a luxury. It's really what drives, you know, the curriculum and education and the infrastructure behind it is important to have working. Um, you know, we have on any given day approximately 3000 devices on our on our you know, connections throughout the four districts. We do have fiber that connects all four of our buildings that we own. So at least we have a good connection, but we need to keep it running. On the state revenue side, um, our chapter 70, as Dr. Fitzpatrick said, we're a minimum district. We get six or thirty dollars a student, so it's about fifty nine thousand dollars. Transportation is the big hit right now. It's a reduction of one hundred and eighty thousand. Charter school. Um, I don't know if everybody knows this, but we as a district pay for students to go to charter schools from Menden and Upton, and then they give us a reimbursement rate, which averages about 14 or 15 percent for next year is what they're projecting. So that's a slight reduction. But the total net thing is our state aid right now is down $150,000. So that doesn't help us when we don't have a lot of other revenue sources. Um, these charts kind of show where chapter 70 has been over the last uh, six years, and you can see it's a nice flat line. Um, the most we got was 1% 1 one year, but you know, we're looking at. Really not a whole lot of money on the state side, so they're looking for the towns to fund the cost of education. This is the charter school chart where it shows you what we pay and what we get reimbursed. It was as high as almost 50% a few years ago, but we're right now we're down to 14%. These numbers are going to change. They put these numbers on the cherry sheet so anybody can get them. At the end, when they have a final cherry sheet, the numbers will be slightly different. Um, in August and September, they'll adjust accordingly. And even as late, like for this fiscal year, we could find out on June 30th that our costs have gone up another 30 or $40,000. It depends on how many kids are actually there. So they project it now, but then it changes as time goes on. Um, on the local side, um, this is basically the enrollment percentages. Now, these percentages factor into how local aid, how the local assessments are calculated. The way that works is you take out all of the fixed costs, state aid, district money, minimum local contributions, all of those are predetermined. The balance after you subtract that out is divided by the enrollment percentages. Um, Mendon has picked up about a half a percent from 24 to 25. These are based on the October 1 enrollment account that we file. Um, so the October 1, 23 re, um, report is what determines FY 25's enrollment numbers. Um, so in the Menden side, um, the minimum contribution was up 529,765. That's determined by the state. What plays into that is what they look at several factors, but one of the main ones is property value and income and growth factors in the towns. Um, and Menden right now is considered an affluent town compared to some other towns in the state, um, which is why we don't get a lot more in Chapter 70 than the $30. 
Uh, transportation, that's the net cost after you take out the reimbursement. So if we get more reimbursement, that would help us. Um, you can see there's like a swap there because that additional money is discretionary money. You know, town has received that through prior overrides for schools. Um, so that the net out is 529 765. This was something that we worked with Jody and Dave on as far as, you know, what could what would be the net bottom line? Because the top three lines are how they break out, but it's the net total that goes up that really matters on the town side, I believe. Um, you can see over the last five years, Menden's local aid increase has only been about 1.6% annualized. It's gone up and down, but if you remember 24, it was actually a reduction, and that's because of what Upton could contribute. On the Upton side, their minimum contribution was 405, 097, so they're a little bit less. One of the other factors that plays into this is target share. We talked about that a lot several years ago. Um, the target share is a moving target, <laughs> ironically. It's never the same from year to year, but right now they want both Menden and Upton to be at the cap, which is 82.5%, and neither town is there. Menden's about 80% and Upton's about 78%, which is why Menden's minimum contribution is higher than Upton's. Um, so they had originally given us a higher number as their net on the bottom in the blue row, but that would have pushed Menden's number closer to 700,000, which means that basically any new money you had coming into Menden would have been going to the school district. We know that that's not a realistic option on the town side. So their number comes down in order to match Menden's contribution. Their assessment over the last few years is about 2.8% if you annualize it. And then we as a district put money in from our own reserves. Now we have appropriated the last two years a million dollars from E&D, and I'll show you the balances of E&D in a second. Um, we're comfortable doing that in that we feel like we still will be able to replenish it. The Upton Share Tech that you see, we have a cooperative agreement with the town of Upton where we are like their tech company. And we have somebody that we employ that works half time for us, half time for the town of Upton. They're on our payroll and Upton pays us half of the cost of that employee. The only change here you see is an $1,100 reduction. And that's because we no longer have debt service. All of the debt, yay, is paid off as of June 1st, I believe, is when the payments do. So that's a good thing because that means it comes off the tax rolls as well. The debt exclusion that was passed 20 years ago goes away. So there should be a reduction. Obviously, there's other things that are going to cost more. Everything else is pretty much the status quo all the way across the board, but we're looking at about 1.28 million from the district's sources. This shows you our E&D certifications over the years. It was around a million dollars, you know, eight years ago. It went down, it's gone back up. Quite honestly, the pandemic was beneficial to us in that there were lots of grants and lots of other funding that we could use to offset costs, which allowed us to put more money or you know, have money saved that would go into E&D. When you see these numbers here, when you see like 1.820 for the FY23 E&D, they've already taken out the million dollars that we have appropriated for FY24. I'm not sure what we'll get certified for for 24 yet because it's too soon to tell, but I'm anticipating it's going to be somewhere in this range still. Uh, school choice is a profit maker for us. We have about, um, what is it, about 145 kids in and about 40 kids out. We get paid for the kids that come in. We have to pay for the kids that go out, whether we're a choice district or not. But it has built up an account there, and we use that to offset salaries in our budget. So when you see the final budget, we're also appropriating a million dollars out of school choice to offset some of those costs because we're making money off of that, and we try to strategically use choice so that we don't have to add staff to bring the students in. You know, if you bring in one two kids and you can spread them out over a certain grade it doesn't impact class size as much so that's why every year we certify choice based on the numbers that we have available in spaces so you would never want to take choice kids in and have to hire a teacher because of it because then it becomes less cost effective is that a one-to-one -one? how do you mean one-to-one -one? uh well, i guess what's the break here like if 50 percent, if we're sending 10 kids out and take 10 kids is it a net yeah, Zero. it's around $5,000 a student that you pay and you receive. So okay. it doesn't even match your per pupil. Um, yeah. The only difference in what you receive or what you pay is if the child's placed out somewhere else and there's special education costs. Yeah. So, for example, if we take a choice student in, say, in second grade, and by sixth grade they have to be an out-of-district placement, that sending district is paying the tuition and not us. Same for us if we have a student choice out and then the costs go up. So it is about the same, yeah. Yeah. So we're a school district of choice. Yes, we are. People want to come. 
Yes. No, this is, has been a choice district for many years, even back into the late 90s. Um, we've always been able to do well with choice because I think this is a good school district. It is um, a bit of a, there's no, like, a spiral, though, that can happen. So if you go back, you know, to when things were tough and there were layoffs, I bet if we tracked the school, oh, yeah. you know, then it that's when it, mm -hmm. it shifts. So when you look at it's it's the communities, a lot of cases that are going through, you know, these financial times and had layoffs and cuts, and then they go, well, I want to take my student over here. And so we're in a, we've been in a really good spot. So there's like a regional um, effect. But it, it. Yeah. it's just no, that, that. <laughs> does it can it can go in those directions it hasn't in a long time here because it's been pretty stable here um, but yeah back well. in but that's where you notice they're you know they come from certain communities and those are the ones that have been struggling yeah, yeah it yeah. i mean back in fy 10 and 11 when we had major reductions we lost a lot of kids that choiced out because their parents were like well i just didn't go somewhere else then yeah. um this chart just basically shows what percentage of the four factors is paid up in, in the state aid are both around 35%. Menden's at 27%. We put in a little over 3% ourselves. So it just gives you a breakdown of the source of revenue. A question on that. So what was the state aid percentage wise last year approximately doing? Around that? the same. It was around yeah, the same. Yeah, because when you're talking $100,000 in a $40 million budget, it's not not going to make a great big factor. I could pull out last year's chart and see. Okay. What I just wanted because I know you, it had gone down. I was just curious. Yeah, the percentage went down. That's all. Yeah, no, it's just the dollars. <laughs> I kind of think if I lose $100, it's a bad thing. So <laughs> never thought I'd be talking about $40 million. <laughs> um, this is the bottom line budget, though. Um, our net revenue increase next year, we're looking at 736569 right now. That's a 1.84% in increase in our budget. Um, obviously, the debt goes off. When it factors into it, we're actually looking at basically a level funded budget, but you can't count that because the debt's going off the books. Um, so that should save everybody on that end. So the question would be, what did we do to get this under control? Because as we said, up until a couple of weeks ago, we had about a million dollar shortfall that we were trying to work our way through based on our revenue. Um, we can go, on, go on to the next one. So what we've done so far is we've got some positions, people that have left positions that we've chosen not to fill at this time. We also, in the last few weeks, last couple of weeks, really, we've got several, um, four or five, I think, uh, yeah. retirement letters. Up to six. six. So it's up to six now. Okay. So there's always a savings with a retirement in that somebody usually retiring is at top step and you hope to bring their replacement in at a lower step. So there can be an offset of sometimes thirty dollars or $40,000, depending on where that replacement falls into place. Um, the out of district tuition, I always budget additional money in those accounts because things can change during the course of the year. So, for example, if tomorrow we have a student that has to get placed out and they go to a public like a collaborative school, we own the tuition tomorrow. If it's a private school, the move in law is actually April 1. So we hope anybody moving into Menden that might be an out of district placement waits till April 2nd to move in so that we get a year break before we own the tuition. Just so people understand the tuition rates for out of district. Oh, yeah. Uh, well, that's a different story. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, so right. last year the state approved, there's a range right. based off of what yeah. services are received. Right. But. So, yeah, you give you an idea of what out of district tuitions cost. The, the bottom, like the least expensive one, is probably around 50000 a year. The most expensive one currently is over $600,000 a year. Um, so, there's a, quite a wide range there. Um, you know, from the student's perspective, they're always going to have the services. The question with the April 1 move-in law is what district is responsible in the next fiscal year, and it's a budgetary planning process. Um, on top of that, the state approves an increase in out-of-district tuition every year. Last year, it was almost 15%. This year, it's a little over 4%. But then on top of that, districts can also apply for an increase if they want. So some tuitions can go up 20% in one year. You generally find that out in July, long after we've all voted our budget and moved on to the next thing. The don't do it now. Um, so that's, but I did reduce that account by a little bit 
you know, we did, I should say, I always say I, we reduced that, you know, I, I reduced what I keep as additional money for those potential things. I still think we're an okay place, but it's a little tighter than I generally would like it to be. We also have reduced some of the software as we look through, when we do this annually, we look at all the software packages that we buy for various things. And if we find something that's really not being used, maybe, you know, four teachers are using it. We are starting to eliminate some of those things. So that was a reduction of about 45,000. And just to add to that, that we've been going through like a overarching with our um, one of our new administrators who came in this year, it kind of tasked her to do like a full review of all of our digital and software and like a curriculum audit. I mentioned like everything is digital now. And so that we're still in process, but we made some reductions already and we're still reviewing some others as well. What are the costs of the uh, communication applications that all the different teachers use? I feel like every time my son gets a new teacher, there's some new stupid app that they're <laughs> using for communication in some way. Is that <laughs> are those are those services all those different services costing us money? Did, Probably not all of them. Not I don't know which ones they're all not, using. Yeah, the okay. big ones come my way, and that would be like Thrively, not Thrively. No, what's the one we not use for? Um, <laughs> what's the one we use to send out like the blast emails? I don't know what's called. Well, Blackboard. that's what that's us though. That's yeah. like district thrill share. Like right. when you thrill get it from share. principals. So that's like a, you know, our our major communication. But you're probably thinking, yeah, like, like the art teacher uses some app, and then uh, the science teacher is using another app, and then the history teacher is using another app. I'm we like, do that to keep you on your toes. Uh, oh, it's great. It's wonderful. Yeah. yeah. So for some of those very yeah. those smaller apps, that's what. Colleen is reviewing right now okay. um, and that's part of it because we one sometimes it's just um it's free right so some of them are yeah, fine, free, but we're doing actually a full review to make sure they're all vetted because yeah. what happened with the pandemic is every single company gave free access to all of these apps oh do this and that and, and you know we were remote and um then now a lot of them you have to pay for them and uh so we're doing a full review on Good. some of those yeah. smaller ones yeah would you like more apps? You might get Yeah, I mean, I just I love them. It's great. Which one? Yeah, right? yeah. Um, that's sorry. a good question. So, as far as grants, we are trying to reallocate some of our grant resources that we maybe had initially attended for something else to offset some of our budgetary costs, and that amounted to around a hundred thousand. And in the budget books, you will see we have a list of all the grants that are just the last two years, and it's a little over two million in the last two years. But generally it's over a million a year in just entitlement grants. And then we've written a lot of competitive grants as well. Um, the, so like a good example of this that we're looking, but it's more of a one-time, we know it's a one-time reallocation right now to kind of help with the budget um, is, you know, there's a civics grant. We do civic action pro projects and, you know, one of the resources we need is our new uh, civics resources for one of our grades. And, it would qualify. And so now instead of having that in our operational budget, we're able to use that grant funds for that. Not all grants allow that. Some some do, some don't, but when we can. So we've been able to help the budget this year with it, but down the road, we won't have that grant when we have to have the renewal and that would have to be operational. So we have to be careful about it as well. All right, and then the last piece is health insurance. So one thing we're making a change and something we've talked about over the last couple of years, but we're going to do it this year is for the food service program. As you know, school lunches are free now um, through the state. They were free through the federal government. The district actually makes out financially better when the state or the federal government pays for lunch than when the students and the families pay for lunch. They pay a higher rate. It's allowed that account to build up some reserves, so we're going to move the cost of health insurance for the employees in the food service program to the food service account, which is something we're allowed to do. There's limits on what you can use that account for, but that is one acceptable thing. So that's about $100,000, and the rest of what we're offsetting is we're proposing a change in our health insurance plan um, for FY25, and it's a plan similar to what the town has, but I think it's less expensive, I hope. <laughs> I don't know. Um, so we initially, you know, we had budgeted 9% as our increase for health insurance, which was generally a pretty good, you know, estimate of what we were looking at. They came back and said 12 and a half percent. They came back last week and said, well, you know, if you change your dental program, now we offer dental to our employees, but they pay 100% of the cost. If we switch it to Harvard Pilgrim, they'll go at 10%. And they told us they were doing this because we're such a good customer. So it <laughs> made me feel really good. <laughs> you know, it's it's. A deal. I got just a deal. 
we're looking at a plan through Mass Strategic Health, which is run through Harvard Pilgrim's network. And we've gotten a quote now. This was a range of five to six percent. That 256 is the six percent. That's the, the quote that rate that we're being proposed right now. So Mass Strategic Health is a self-funded plan, very similar to the Maya plan that the town is on through Blue Cross Blue Shield. The gist of it, it means that you pay the health care costs. There is what's called stopgap coverage to cover high catastrophic claims. And then there's a pool that you participate in so that some of the other claims kind of get spread out amongst a much larger, larger risk group. It's a common model in the business world. I don't think it is in the educational world, but a lot of districts are switching to it as we go forward. We have to get the teachers union to approve it because they have very specific, it's written into their contract that we have to have Harvard Pilgrim. Um, we, you can't make changes to health insurance anyway without collectively bargaining it. That's one of the collective bargaining laws. Um, so we're looking at to make that change, which would reduce our costs considerably. Um, and, you know, if we can do that and all that comes together, then we have a balanced budget. And obviously, if we cannot get an agreement on the health insurance change, then we're having we're going to be looking at having to reduce another four or five hundred thousand dollars from the budget in one way or the other. Um, it will not change the town's assessments once we certify those, which we did last week. We're not allowed to increase them anymore. So what we've sent to the towns is what it's going to be. It all plays into what happens in the district. And we're still waiting. The state budget isn't going to get approved till probably July. Um, so we're hoping that they're going to come up with some additional money, with, which will help us out. Out of district is always a, a risk because you don't know what's happening. Kids are in and out of evaluations quite regularly. Um, there could be other retirements. Like Maureen said, we just got a couple more this week, I believe, right? Mm -hmm. um, Enrollment can change. Um, school choice can change. There's lots of things that can change. My nightmare is unexpe unexpected facility needs. I meet with our director of buildings and grounds pretty much every day. We call it the morning brief where he tells me what broke last night and what it's going to cost to fix it. Um, it seems like there's always something. And then I'll go back. Maureen or so we you know we really want to be transparent about where where we're at um we you you heard actually um I'm proud of our work that we've done the last number of years of allocating grant funds when we can do that um I we've really been strategic about some of our investments and uh the ESSER funds that we received we did not like some districts, and he, uh, Dr. Fitzpatrick mentioned this too, we did not use it for um, anything that was recurring. So it was just one time cost. Uh, we only had one uh, EL teacher, English language learner teacher, and we gradually added that to the budget because that was a requirement. So we had to do it, and that helped us cover it a couple years ago. And so we're not in a place where um, that gap between revenue and expenditures is getting larger because of misallocation of grant funds or anything like that. Um, we are just with the fixed increases are getting to that point and we are using and want to admit we are using these, you know, if you want to call it the one time funds or um, emergency reserves of E and D and school choice more so than we had in the past. And we recognize that and the purpose is to make sure that we could get through again an, another year, um, but we don't have a million coming in every year, right? And so we've been able, to, it's been healthy and we're really happy with that, but uh, we know that that isn't something that can continue and we just wanna be able to share that as well. We also project out if it does come true, what they project out in student enrollment is going to be increasing. We are noticing in particular um, at Memorial and uh, the class sizes. So we, in the last few years, we've had to focus on elementary teachers to make sure cl elementary class sizes weren't getting to be too large. Some of those classes are now coming up into the middle school. So we've held off or um, reduced some positions at the middle and high school because of lower enrollment. That's not good. We can't sustain that in the long term. So we're we're getting by, and that's where um, some more positions requests are going to start coming in. Uh, we talked about some of the increasing facility maintenance costs. That is, you know, nightmare. Also, my nightmare because you know we'll come march in my office and let me know what just broke as well. Uh, and that's why we've been really focused on some of our capital planning as well. Um, but we know that. We all fall within the limits of, you know, prop two and a half. 
we know that the last time that we went forward as like a a larger override request of both towns was back in 2015 15. which was 16 right thank you and uh members Ford 15 was the campaign but um and we had said at the time the previous superintendent said at the time you know the the structure is every five years we might need more um, investment when i came on board during COVID, we're, we've been trying to extend that with the COVID funds so we can go as long as we can, and but want to kind of mark this moment right now that next year is the fiscal cliff that we see coming. Um, how much we're still going to work on kind of projecting out and all that, but want to be clear that that's where we have greater concerns of not being able to to get by without um, really reducing with that line where we have level services and going into reduced services. Um, so just. I can't I, I can't predict the future, right? But uh, we definitely um, yeah, just want to be upfront about that and trying to work together and collaboratively and, and thinking about the best approach. I mean, if you look at our budget over the last four or five years, it's never been even 2% as an increase. It's been, you know, one and a half last year. I think it was less than 1%. It's really difficult when you have only less than $800,000 in new money coming in on a $40 million budget to continue to provide the services that you're providing. Eventually, it's going to catch up to you. And we've done a good job of putting it off longer than I think was initially anticipated, but I do think, yeah. you know, that's why we're looking over right now. We haven't jumped yet. Yeah. No, <laughs> okay. Jason, you were going to ask a question. Uh, I was going to ask how close to capacity we are at our schools. Uh, we're not. Uh, Memorial, Memorial. Memorial. So Memorial's capacity is about 580, 590, and we're at about 520, I think, there. So we're getting closer there. Nitmuck has room. Nitmuck at one point used to have 1,100 kids in there. It's only at about 550 right now. So there's room there. Misco is very full. Misco is yeah. at about there are, 50. Um, there's just there not a lot of space. Every space in Misco is is used. Is that what? And, uh, you know, I mean, like we do the best that we can, but it's um, it's it's full. So that yeah. in your future capital plans, a new school, not, not new schools. Uh, all right, I'm so scaring anybody. Yeah, I mean, no. new spaces. That's a that's a good question. So the number one um, need is a new roof at Nipmuc, and so we also put in a statement of interest with the MSBA, just like um, BBT, you know, spoke to, and for a request for. A roof, so that is our our number one. If you go through all the needs, we had a facilities assessment done, and we also have a. If you're ever want to read it and look at it, you know, or come to our capital planning meetings, the um on our webpage though that facilities assessment. I mean, it had like 80, 80 million for our schools. For we would come forward to eighty, but um you know we've for been okay. trying to go through that and prioritize, and uh, it they didn't. I was surprised, you know, because Misco is an older school, right? Everyone knows that that's it doesn't certainly doesn't feel as new as everyone else. And uh, that didn't come up as a oh, like there's huge safety or you need none of the markers for like you have to get a new school. Uh, but it is something we we talk about, but there are large aspects of I and mean, you can speak to it of needs and facility yeah. needs that are at all four of the buildings and MISCO is one of them as well. I mean, the big needs that we look at besides roofs, so the roof at Clough Memorial also at 20 years old are going to need repair or replacement soon. MISCO was done about 10 years ago. That's the debt that's coming off the books right now. Nitmux is 27 years old. Some of it is shingles. The shingles are blowing off. One of the other issues at Nipmuc is all the HVAC units are on that roof. So in order to replace it, they have to come off and they are also 27 years old. More than likely that equipment has to get replaced as well. Um, energy management systems in all the schools. Really the, the one we have at Nipmuc, you can't get parts for. If the thing breaks down, that's it. It just doesn't work anymore and everything's done manually. Um, we've just recently put in water treatment systems. I know the town is going through that here for PFAS, the everybody's favorite thing at Clough and Misco. Those were funded through grants that we did through uh, the, I think DEPs was where the source of those were. So we've kind of upgraded that, but 
there's just lots of things. The carpets at Nipmuc uh, is the same carpet that was installed in 1996. Um, it's not in great shape. There's a section of uh, Misco where Jody's name is still carved on the wall from when she. <laughs> Keeping that. <laughs> <laughs> no. uh, I didn't. <laughs> so they gave us an assessment, like Maureen said, it was almost $90 million. We're trying to pare that down to what's really important because they looked at everything, you know, yeah. everything you could come up with. But there's a lot of needs there. And we're not going to come to the town and say, hey, you know, we need all this stuff. A new school would you know, would be an exorbitant cost. New schools right now, middle schools and high schools are running in the 120 to 200 million range. So think about that. When we built Nipmuc, it was 20 million. So it's very expensive. I think, you know, I think we can do what we need to do with our facilities. I think enrollment wise, we have the capacity, but at the elementary schools, Clough is in good shape. Clough is the one school that was built for about almost 500 and it's at like 330 right now. Uh, Menden has not been growing as fast as Upton has. So there might be some reconfiguration of how we, you know, are doing things, and it's stuff that we have to work on. So yeah. we're taking up a lot of your time. One question: the um, slide you had with the pyramid of uh, uh, level service, uh, critical, strategic, competitive. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Do you actually have um, costs or expenses associated with those programs, like line item detail? I, I, I see the English of the request or of no, I just I just see like a therapeutic resource. What 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 is the impact of that resource to a budget? So is that what's a fully? Yeah. So let's yeah. talk about okay. the therapeutic. Really good. And it's in. Uh, the, yeah, it's in. So the, it's in when I look at it, I wonder if you know it's in the book. Look, OK, yeah, there's a page in the book and it was in the hearing presentation. It's at the back of this, but the um, that's a good question because they're all it's all you know, they're all different, but with that, we already have um, an adjustment counselor and this was added in, I, I'm losing track when we did the bridge, the bridge Two program, ago, Two, you know, it was the post COVID thing. So we have return to school services at each school and we add an adjustment counselor at the middle school and one at the high school to help students who are in and out hospitalization or needed additional mm -hmm. needs. So that adjustment counsel we already have there. What we need is a special educator that can provide the therapeutic supports. So that would be one teaching position right. of. I mean, the reason I cost. asked is we're doing on, on, on yeah. the town side, you know. When you look at. The whole scope of all that stuff that's a big number mm -hmm. but in incremental uh increases in budget is a, to me a, a something that's more um oh. affordable and palatable just to build towards something so maybe we're looking two years out but we're starting to plan and we with the library last year we collaborated with the library where they use some of their state aid money to help fund a full a resource and over two years, we'll now incorporate that fully into the budget, assuming our budget goes the way I think it's going to go this year. So, but I mean, there's things like that. When I so when I see pieces, smaller pieces, I say, I wonder what that one, what the impact to the budget is, and is there a way you can start to think about how do we start to build towards adding these critical needs rather than trying to, you know, do it all at once. Right. Yeah, yeah, and that is what we it's choices within in that area and. You know, so within a year or two, we will have to have an EL teacher because we're mandated. And if our numbers continue to increase, we, we're not actually going to be able to provide the mandated service hours for learning English, right? So, so, so. so that's the next one, therapeutic. That can be a savings as well as helping students because if they don't go e EL is a good example. Know. So in two years, we, we have to have an EL resource brought on probably yes so just is to work with me here jay right. yeah <laughs> right. you have to in two okay. years so in two cycles what are we doing to make sure that we know we're going to have bandwidth in the budget so instead of dealing with it next year are we doing anything now to start to sort of squirrel things away to understand this is how we're going to be able to fund that in two years well, so the way we phased in i don't know this is last, me, yeah the way we phased in the last el teacher because we just added one i want to say two years ago or three years ago that was the that's their grant money, right yeah. we used the grant money and then we slowly phased the salary right and portions into the budget to bring it in um you know el is a good example because when i started at the district we had five kids that needed those services and we're up to around 80 right now 
So again, that's you're talking 15 years. I think we're um, going to have a very similar discussion when we get into the safer grant topic is my guess. Yeah. You know, how do we make sure if we want to go forward a particular program, but we've got a multi year deadline to make sure we can fully fund it. What's our plan to be ready in right. two or three years to make sure we're supporting it? And right. we we already know some of these like so, you know, yeah. we know we need the therapeutic supports. That's one we know we'll need the EL. We have a smaller class going through the middle school right now. They've requested for positions at other of the larger class grades because we haven't been able to fill. You know, we've are rotating teachers from the one smaller grade right now to cover in the other grades. Once hopefully I'm making sense here that grade is seventh grade. Now they go to eighth grade next year. That next year we will then have that increased enrollment of every class coming through and we would have to have the certain number of teachers at the middle school. So we we can predict out as well as at the elementary, especially that's why we track enrollment so closely because we try to keep certain class sizes. But if it, if you have, you know, 10 more kids or six more kids that come into a grade and you're already at that kind of, you know, max that you want at a certain grade level, then that's pushing it over and that becomes this next critical need, you know, in there as well. Um, and then I know it's at the top, but like the tech support, um, our poor tech team, of like three support. people, you know, four people, but we now have over 3000 devices. I mean, I have a whole list from their presentation of the amount of devices and, and, and needs, and we only have a few people and that's, you know, post pandemic, it just increases in digital uh, needs over the time. Um, so all good. Good the question. Technology department didn't list staff as well. They requested it. We just didn't. Oh, we just didn't put it on the get approved. Okay. Yeah, so that's what's approved. <laughs> but in their presentation, so on the website is what everyone presented. Right. And what's interesting, if you too, by the way, I all of here. we yeah. put <laughs> the past years up there too, so you can kind of you know start to track over the years as well. You know, like with tech, in a perfect world, you would have a tech support person in each building all day long in case something goes wrong. We don't have that right now. So sometimes something goes down and it might be the next day before somebody gets there to fix it. And I know that doesn't sound like a lot when you're at home and so, you know, your computer's not working, but when you've got a whole bunch of kids in the middle of a lesson and suddenly. Yeah, no, that wouldn't away. be tolerated in a corporate environment. <laughs> well, and if you think 395 employees, but, you know, 200 teachers right. and you have you know, 2000 kids or yeah, it, it, it's uh, that all have devices. Yeah, it's um, they they do a great job, but it's uh, it's taxing for sure. Yeah, I have a question um, <clears throat> concerning teacher salaries in general, because um, obviously we've seen probably more teacher strikes in the last year in Massachusetts than we I have anyways in the last, yeah. I don't know how many years. How is our salaries compared to a similar districts in the area? We're in the middle. I'd say we're not the top and we're not the bottom. Yeah. Um, we're in negotiations right now. Um, and, you know, right now everything is fine. Yeah. Um, you know, it's hard to say, but yeah, I'm, we I'm not anticipating we tend to that's an issue. Yeah, uh, <laughs> we have a really good relationship with the with the union so that's it's been it's negotiations are always a long process but um it's 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 going well but um i would say like we compare ourselves we're blackstone valley so we look at blackstone valley but we also always look at who's next to us that might not be so we we are also right next to hopkinton westboro um trying to think who else milford. we kind of throw in there we well milford's blackstone yeah. valley officially but they're like their own entity but um so we we do that and if you go a little bit east like on that 495 we we are lower than that 495 and but we are above some that are a little bit west of us what about retention has it been pretty level over there uh yes that's an interesting question we've always had really good retention it, it's been different since covid what happened was the market opened that's the only way I can say it. So if you went to a district, you could never, and you had 15 years of experience and a master's, no other district in the past pre-COVID would ever hire you because you'd come in too high. But then because so many people retired and left education, all of those positions opened. And so then sometimes you're like, yeah, 
we could hire you at this rate, we'll hire you here. There's a lot more flexibility. So we were able to do that. So we brought people, you know, higher at times that had a certain skill set. And, and um, so I would say the retention in general in Menden Upton is really strong. Yeah. You know, recently talked to some teachers who were like, I'm a lifer, I love it here, this is great, you know. And we have a lot from the local areas, but um, I don't think, if if you are looking for more money and you can go east towards Boston, you're going to make a lot more money than around here. Um, but that's not a lot of people around here like to. It's true for anything, here. probably. Yeah, yeah, no, it's a it's really good question. And things have changed a little bit, too. It really is. Um, it's a little different than it used to be. So I'm noticing it's getting quite late, so I guess. Uh, are there any more questions for Dr. Collins? If you do have any, just send them my way, Maureen's way. Yep. Happy to answer. Thank, thank, thank you for you this time. very thorough presentation. Yeah, thank, thank you. Thanks, you. Very Thanks a lot. Uh, my son, he said he was going to be in front of us, so. <laughs> but he can stay up later than me. Yeah, so thank you so much for your time. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so next. Yeah, so following the, oh. I know. So we've got a, uh, we've got uh, parks, historic, and water. I believe are all the same person, but we have parks is next. Not gonna stay. Everybody is online. It looks like. <laughs> yeah. Uh, what are we doing? Parks, water, historic. Okay. I mean, that's the order. That's I, I believe they're you, right? So, <laughs> I think. CD. If there's a different order that you would like to do it. I don't think so. Um. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right, so I mean the, the parks budget is fairly straightforward. What we're asking for, um, I think overall it's a 3.2%, um, 3.27% increase. Um, we asked for some nominal increases in certain lines, pretty much to cover contractual increases, inflation increases, supplies, um, fuel, things like that. Um, we are asking for a small increase in the maintenance and lifeguard salary lines to enable us to stay competitive. Minimum wage has now stabilized, but we're finding we still need to offer more money. Um, I think this summer we're going to end up having to reimburse for lifeguard training, for example, just in order to get enough applicants. I thought the seasonal lifeguard, things like that were funded through the revolving account. No, so that the landscape maintenance crew is funded through the general fund and the lifeguards are funded through the general fund. The summer program and the concession stand are funded through the revolving fund. And that's just been the way it's it's been set up. I mean, and then the and then the receipts from the beach. So beach admissions, the revenue from swim lessons and season passes goes back to the general fund, whereas the food you buy stays in the concessions or the revolving account. So I think I mean that's I have three point two seven, but I may have done this. I may have included my own salary and put in two percent, which I don't know what you did. All right, that's why it's different than me. Put it in somewhere in the neighborhood. Two and a half. I have two point two five. Yeah, it's probably close enough. Yeah, then whatever is sub obviously. Yeah. You know, we're also in negotiation, so that will be right. another item to be considered. Um, I will bring up the one item or two items for parks. Um, the one item we've brought up before, we need a long term solution for a facility for the landscape maintenance crew. Um, you know, if this senior project passes, which would be wonderful. I think we would be the perfect people to take over the old building. I think that could be very easily converted into a combination workshop, garage, and then offices and program space. I've had a few conversations with John Dudley about this and what their needs are, um, but I think that's something that, that would be a great use of that building and it would remain a community building. Um, but other than that, we've got to figure out a solution, whether that's building a new garage at the park, renovating Morrison Drive. I think. There's several options out there. Um, I know the cost of a new building was about 300,000 when we looked at it. And just a yeah. memory refresher, this is because the 
storage of your equipment is scattered about town it's extra time and labor to go get all of that retrieve it and there's no central meeting place for all of that as well yeah so right now we're utilizing the shell the morrison drive shell as our home base it's got a dirt floor it has no utilities no water no electric and that's where the, the equipment is stored the mowers are currently crammed in that garage behind the bathrooms and that's kind of our workshop so like if i want to work you know again there's no heat there's no running water in the off season um, and like you said, we spend a ton of time shuffling things from here to there. That is it. Does that building have the proper insurance set up on it? Which building? Morrison? Morrison. I don't know. Do you I would be. I would be a garage. Yeah, or? no, I mean, I don't think you should be used to that building. We 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 fenced that off like 10 years ago because it was absolutely not supposed to be open no for idea. use. I have no I we, what I can tell you the history. So what during COVID, we I just, left the, highway and went over the, there. Let's just but, yeah, well, let's just look at it and make sure we're not have any risk there. That discussion yeah. at some point. But I know they yell at us to cut the grass around it, but I don't know how it's classified <laughs> as. That's all I can tell you. Every year Lori emails me and says the insurance company said to cut back the brush. Okay. Um, but yeah, that's probably a good point. Um so that I mean that's the, the first issue. Well, and just to the point, though, we've, we've allocated, I think, 50,000 for study associated with the legacy, the old senior, if the senior center passes, we've bucketed some funds to look at reconfiguration and design, but that could also be used to look at another solution somewhere else if the senior center, mm -hmm. the senior center will pass, and let's even go down yeah. to plan B. Yeah. I mean, I think, yeah, and we did some work. I could, I could see. Bill, Bill looking at me saying, don't say it. Well, I, th I think that's an added bonus to this project is you, right. you know, I know it's a little bonus, but you're getting two buildings for the price of one. You're not walking away from this existing facility. Yeah, I just want to acknowledge that. Yeah, yeah that's on okay. a lot of radar right now. Um, and then the other issue is staffing. We need a longer term solution for the landscape maintenance position and crew. We have relied on seasonal kids to do this work and we're reaching a point that it's just not feasible um, and I the people we've had are wonderful they're absolutely doing the best they can but to expect 16 17 18 year old kids with minimal experience to be able to take on the workload it's reaching a point you know we were incredibly fortunate this summer that our same foreman was able to come back for one more year but he's a college senior he's likely going to get a job offer in the real world and then that'll be it um, you know, again, it, it, you're looking at this new senior center. That's a whole new building that'll have some involved maintenance. It's going to have all sorts of curbing and sidewalks. You know, we did all the work here, and so now this went from being a little bit of grass to a much more involved project to maintain. Um, so I think again, it's not part of our request this year, but it's something that's going to need to be addressed. I know John and I made a presentation about one possible opportunity. Um, you know, whether that's some sort of leveraging a shared position or something it just it, we got to do something okay. and so maybe after we get through this budget right. budget cycle we can start talking about the long-term goals or longer term goals and i think you know it relates to our conversations about uh public works in general mm -hmm. um so so I think I'm going to try and like yeah sorry speed things along. I know like your yours are short, but we still have two people in line behind you. So um, or two groups. So I know and you're three. You're yeah, three well, so group. historic is very simple. I believe we just requested level funding. Okay. Um, just for clarity, the historic district has one line for 500 bucks. That's basically postage and hearing expense. We are currently not charging applicants for historic district process because we felt that. That was just an undue burden at this point, and it's it's such a minimal expense. The commission same 500 for postage, and then another 3,000, which is used for various signage and things like that. So, and I I didn't mean to cut people off from questions about this year's budget. So I just if there are, we can still get those in for parks and then for historic. And if not, I guess, can we move on to water? Yeah, and then so water, I think, is a little bit bigger discussion. Oh, OK, so uh, the water for the, again, we have an enterprise fund. So the water I would separate into two categories within the general fund is the town owned public water supplies. So that's your town hall, your park, your senior center, your library. Uh, that will include this new senior center um, that will be required to be a public water supply. So there will be increased costs with that to monitor it. 
Um, our request is minimal. We're asking for just a small uh, $1,500 increase to cover contractual um, services related to the, the monitoring of the wells. We have a certified water operator we contract with. Um, I will just be transparent. I think we now have the new well installed, all the new testing and everything, sample scheduling. There's all sorts of changes coming with PFAS. I think it's very likely we will need to put on PFAS treatment in this building. Um, the test results are coming back around five. The current limit is 20, but the new proposed limit is basically zero. Um, and I, it's an ongoing process, and I believe there's still funding in that special account for the treatment system. But I just want to make you aware that is something that may come down the road. What kind of impact do you think that has? Like what, what's coming down the road? Do you have a number? I don't, and I, I don't know off the top of my head what the cost of that treatment system is. I believe if, if for this building, it would effectively be carbon filtering. And there may be some options here because it's not like nobody lives here. We may just be able to post signage that says don't drink the water, use bottled water. I, re I retract my question for the <laughs> sake of the budget um, discussion. But like it, it may be a solvable problem, but yeah. right. we'll wait till all the regulations. It does seem like we need to have more, more conversations yes. that will affect future budget right. cycles. Yeah, I, th I mean, knock on wood, I think we're okay for this year. We have a little bit of a surplus because of all the previous testing that was very high, so I think we're okay. Um, and then the other portion of our budget is the enterprise fund, so that is the public system that services about 153 accounts. Um, the net budget is a positive. It's intended to generate a small amount of revenue. The whole point is for us to build up reserve so when things break, we can pay for them. Um, I'm just looking at our proposed our proposed budget. I think our revenue we're saying is going to go up 0.9 percent. Our expenses are oh no, I'm sorry. Our revenue is going to go up two percent, and our expenses are going up 2.64 percent. And the projected bottom line is a, is a surplus of 5,700 dollars. Um, again, there is we're in the process of negotiating with Hopedale a potential amendment to the contract. We may need to amend these numbers um, pending the result of that, but the, the bottom line won't change. It's just basically going to be a slight increase on both expense and revenue, depending on the terms of what gets negotiated there. Um, we're hopefully negotiating an opportunity to allow some additional commercial use on the 140 system, which will then come with hopefully some tax revenue. Right. Um, unfortunately, that's likely going to come with some increased costs. I think if there's anything else, I think that's it. I know. I don't see if Kevin or anyone is here. Um, I know there were maybe some questions about ARPA funding, which you've talked about. I think there is another request from the water related to ARPA okay. that's coming from Jack Hunter. We're trying to get a number. I believe I emailed you. It's maybe 10 to 20,000 for a small extension of a water main for a new meter pit. Um, otherwise, it sounds like the water study is fully funded. To the best of our knowledge, the, the, I guess right the parts we committed to. Right, well, I think are, right. through phase the three, phases, we've yes. been able to allocate funding for, and we're currently in phase two. Right. So I think that's everything I have. Um, I do think at some point we should plan a discussion about the next steps of that water study in terms of who is running it. Yeah. Um, I think you know as we now get past some of the stuff and move on to the actual technical aspect of it. Um, you know, as long as we have Jack Hunter, that's great, but I know that's come up in the Water Commission a few times, and I think they would like an opportunity to set up a joint meeting, just some of the discussion that's happened in those meetings. Joint Again, meeting with? With the select, select board. board. I think there's some. And Jack, or? I think it would be good to involve Jack. I, you know, I, I just. spoke about it last week at our meetings. So. I think there's some confusion over going forwards. Who is running this study? Who is the point of contact? Right. Is it you? Is it us? Is it right. Jack? And I think everybody is doing some small piece of it. Right. But I, I think as we move forward, we maybe want to condense that to identify one chain of command. I would say any board or committee out there that wants to meet with us, shoot us an email, we'll put you on the agenda. Um, you know, I let's yeah, just maybe. get it get it done. So I I think that's everything I had. I don't know if you had any questions about the warrant articles related to water, but if that's e, not for tonight, that's fine too. I think we're probably going to be revisiting the warrant 
next week as well because we have until the ninth. So <laughs> I think it's not finalized. So we we may anyhow. We'll see. We'll try and get home before midnight. But <laughs> um there's David's spending his longest day for his last day. This is your last meeting with us, right, David? Uh, great. Thanks, Stan. Thank, Thank you. Appreciate you so it. Much. Thank you. Thank you for waiting. All right, so next up we have Kevin fell on aging. Thank you. Thank you so much for your patience and thank you to you also, Andrew. Sorry. <laughs> I was just sitting this. Morning. I wish I know. we knew exactly how long the thing was going yeah. to take. It's all right. Actually, it's very interesting. But I think it, oh, it, yeah, it being yeah. had to be postponed from last week to this week, but it was going to run. Right, right. Yeah, it's, uh, it's a lot. But yeah, it is It is good that you were able to hear this whole presentation. Yeah, for sure, for sure, for sure. Um, I just wanted to say, um, the Senior Center is a multifaceted resource center. I'd like to say human resource center, but I don't want to take away from our own human resource director. Oh, and so, I'm sorry, would you mind just introducing yourselves for, oh, yeah. just for the you know, people who Amy are Amy Wilson Kent, Senior Services Thank Director. You. Peg Noguera, Council on Aging. She's our, she's our uh, co coordinator there. So, one thing we had about 10 years or so ago, we adopted a saying, and the saying is this. Um, Menden Senior Center, making a, um, making a difference in the li life of others. And that's really kind of what we do in a nutshell. But I don't know if any of you were able to um, see the document that I sent over late today that lists um, a list of all our services and um, in general, because you could take each one of them and you could break it down even further to see all the many, many ways we do assist people in this community. Um, it's not just bingo. In fact, it's not bingo at all. No, um, we don't play bingo. Well, we, we are going to play. We're going to play music bingo. Where oh, well, all right. Once, so twice a year we play bingo. So um, as far as our salary is, our salary, I'm sorry. As far as salaries are concerned, uh, actually that falls under the um, treasurer collector has um, is coordinating that. I don't have that um, in here for, for my director salary. But in terms of our, our um, line items, we have a total increase of 2,150, and um, the majority of that is for contract services to do with our building. Um, a lot of our um, the expenses to, to manage the facility have increased. Um, the biggest of those is with um, custom alarm, because when we switched over from a Verios, excuse me, Verizon system to Fios, um, which we wanted to do for years for consistency because with the Verizon lines, we were having interference with our alarm system repeatedly, especially when it rained. And so when we finally got the okay uh, from custom alarm to switch over to Fios and Verizon had been telling us for years to do it, we were already set up for Fios. We had Fios in the building. Our custom alarm increases uh, for both um, daily monitoring and our annual um, testing increased um, significantly. So um, we have that. And uh, we also moved one expense from meeting and dues that really uh, was more appropriately placed in contract services for so $175 for the ability to be able to show films at our senior center. We have to have a, um, it's called a motion picture license to in order to do that. And so annually it's approximately $175. So between increases in um, septic costs, the furnace, co furnace uh, main maintenance annual, um, as I said, the cost for the alarm system and this total for that line item, um, increased and we thereby we had a reduction in the line item for meetings and dues because we had moved it now in terms of all our other expenses um, we previously had postage had its own line item that was put into supplies which we were not feeling comfortable with we that now has its own line item again so we took that out of supplies the fuel for uh, heating the building and electricity for lights were both combined to one line item and we 
would um, ask that they could be separated. And so those were just minor changes there. So in terms of our expenses, um, not very, you know, not a very um, many. Where we are asking for um, an increase is in 14 hours for our um, admin assistant position. Um, the position has been going well, um, but it, 18 hours, we're not a lot, we're not able to, to do everything that that position was originally um, scheduled to do under, you know, the description that we came up with the Collins Center. Um, 18 hours isn't a lot of time. So I'm still doing a lot of things that we were hoping um, that that position would do. And likewise, I'm not able to focus on things like grant funding, um, which, the senior center van um, was a grant that one of my first big grants that I tackled when I came to Menden. It's very time consuming, very, very large grant, um, involved a lot of moving parts. I did have assistance with it. We don't have time to do things like that. To, to Their grants are, are out there, um, but in order to, to search them and then to be able to write them and then to be able to implementing them, implement them, implementing them is yet another thing. So, and then you have to report on how, um, how things did progress. So um, in terms of ser servicing people that are coming in, um, we really need to have more consistent um, coverage. We do use senior workers from the work program when, when that 18 hour a week person is not there, we do have senior workers. There's been a lot of training that that goes with that. Those workers are also working in other departments. When their 100 hours are up, another one comes in, another one that we have to train. And um, so for consistency sake, it would be very helpful to and serve the seniors in, a, in probably a better fashion. Um, also, what else? Um, Retention is something that I have been concerned about because this is the fourth person in this position. Uh, we've gotten quality people. They've obviously used us kind of as a stepping stone. You know, they've been with us three years, they've been with us two years, but then they've moved on to full-time positions. So um, it's something that certainly I want, you know, for us to be able to, to discuss. And the Council on Aging, we've, we've had this discussion with the large number of seniors that we have in this town now and the hours that were open and the people that we have working there, we cannot possibly handle all the requests that we are getting. I personally worry about them not even being able to take a vacation day. Do you know this was Amy's day off this week? I'm just telling you, it's quarter past nine and she's been working all, it was supposed to be her vacation day. Uh, there's, just, there's just too many demands on the center and really not enough people to handle the requests so the, the we don't admin want to assistant grab. currently works 18 hours. 18 hours. And how many hours is the senior center open a week? Uh, let's see. It's, I'm sorry, I have to do that. Know. So that is seven. You're talking it's, about the hours on the door or you're talking yeah, about yeah, the hours yeah, that open yeah. half day on half day on Fridays. So right. it's 32. Right. So yeah, certainly there's no way that that one person right. can right be there so it's no it's and, often you or the the senior workers or, right you know. well i reach outreach coordinator she and i kind of take turns like if um i'm not going to be there she will close and lock up the building the senior workers don't have keys for the building so mm -hmm. they don't have the ability to do that council we, doesn't either yeah and we also we also do have a s system where we do not want any one senior there by themselves no so it no. has to be one of us workers right so, yeah. so this so this position, the additional 14 hours would be having someone go from part time to full time. So typically yes. then there's the the benefits cost to that. that is so so is that is that folded into the mm -hmm. increase that's listed? Yes. Here? Okay. That 40 okay. Yeah. The so benefits that, represent about thirty one thousand um, dollars okay. to that mix. So the only thing that is reflected in here because um, Amy, in addition to some of the other positions, are actually you're the only union position. The others are non-union personnel. Right. So the only the only thing that that forty thousand dollars represents the forty thousand eight hundred and fifty is the thirty one thousand dollar benefit package that would actually come with a a full time employee in addition to the additional fourteen hours. Actually, forgive me for just saying, and um, we we are proposing that we use 
five, pay five hours from our state grant. We are doing that currently with the outreach position. Mm -hmm. We have been doing that. So it would be nine. It would be, yeah, I'm sorry. It would be the nine hours. Yes, the nine hours, which comes out to $9,828. Yep. Said nine, 9850. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. So, 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 75% of this increase is just benefits. Mm -hmm. Which I know we have to plan for that. Um, employees don't always take that. You know, our current one of our current employees is not taking that, you know, um, benefit. Um, right, but it needs to be budgeted. It needs to be budgeted. Mm -hmm. And if it's not used, does it go back to free cash? Mm -hmm. Is that where it goes? Mm -hmm. okay. It could be leveraged for other budget needs, whether it be line item transfers at the year at the end of the year. Um, interdepartmental budget transfers or budget wide, and then ultimately any unexpended um, budget line items go roll into free cash calculations. Also, we rely on the friends of Menden Elders. They're our financial arm of the senior center, and they do a lot of fundraising. And earlier in the evening, you had approved, although you didn't have to, the yard sale, which is their primary thing. And so they they fund many events at yep. the center. That, that we don't even put in the budget because yeah. it's carried right. by someone else. Right. We are pretty frugal down there. There is. Can you send a copy of the job description you mentioned that the Collins Center did for this position? Absolutely, yes. yes. Thank you. In the essence of trying to walk towards a solution, uh, is there a middle ground of instead of going directly to full time, definitely increasing hours, but not getting all the way up to full time? I guess the possibility would, it's not totally ideal, but would be possibly job sharing sorts. Um, and then we, what we would do is we probably would take the job description and break things out. I didn't think you were saying that. Oh, that you're saying like less hours instead of the nine hours. hours. I think what Michael is saying is just increasing this person's hours from the current footprint. Right. But and still being the, under the is it under the 20 hours the limit. Yep. Yeah. Benefit. Benefit. So it point. would be two hours. At oh, so, okay. so I mean going from 20 hours is the limit for benefits. Yeah. Okay. I was going down the path. Wow. I was looking at the responsibilities yeah. and right. seeing it's, it's, I mean, I wondered about that one. also. I know like Amy and I have talked hours. about that, whether there could be a second right. part time person that would be yeah. same number of hours, but without the benefits. But I know that would be, I guess, potentially the same issue with retention if, you know, right. the stepping be. stone issue. But like, I don't know, it's still. It still might be a, an avenue worth exploring because the 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 benefits part is so big. Right. Yeah. So big. The the nice thing about that it would be almost like someone would be there to be able to cover someone's vacation. Right. You know, which is we, we're struggling. But yeah, we're getting our back up against yeah. the wall with vacations because they're they're going to be use or lose, and then who fills in the gap? I mean, would also say with the with the senior community center if that if that passes. Is there a new staffing plan that needs to be brought up for that anyway? So should we be doing this now? Should we just be in the, the stopgap, be looking at either multiple multiple part-time and then figure that out should the center pass? Is it source of a package? Across the town, yeah. there's an opportunity here. I mean, I think Amy used the term job sharing. Mm -hmm. But when you look at the openings that exist and are going to exist, I think it it falls neatly into the discussion we hope to have around how do we best structure the operations, right? Right. So, um, but I guess there are, there are the the short term needs. And then well, I would say this, and I think it's to, to the point well made is, if nothing changed tomorrow, what what is the impact? If you do not increase the hours or or what have you? Okay, grants grants don't get researched and. Yep. You know, mm -hmm. and, and and as I said, they're out there. Um, clients have to wait longer for services. Yep. Um, right. You know, uh, it's a lot of it's a lot of training on our part that with senior workers are wonderful, mind you. They're they're excellent. They show up. Um, they're you know they they want to work, but they have to be trained, and right. then they then they're right. and that out. and that takes your time yeah. or it takes the assistance. That's, that's, well, that might. Right. It's been her. Right. It was always my hope that, that the assistant would help, you know, right. train them. But you've but. been training the new assistant. So and training the, the new seniors that have come on board. Right. We have some wonderful seniors that are coming on board, but they are used by a lot of different departments and a lot of them are going to be maxing out soon. So then you bring a new crop on and right. you have to train them. And then that takes more of your. Yes. 
And we have regular volunteers. I'll just speak for myself. Right, yes. I, I came into the senior center in uh, 2011 and never left, uh, you know, <laughs> went from one job to another, but no, it's, and we're more than happy to do it because we believe in it right. and we see the results. Yes. So when does a decision need to be made on this? Well, he wants you to send them some. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. I don't have my well, yeah, that, I mean, I think this is more of a general budget right. discussion. Yeah. Right. Yeah, and just to understand the process for the benefit of, of you guys and kind of bringing this forward. It's the same thing. Um, sorry, I get tired at night and my voice starts to us a bit. I think it's of the benefit of everybody to have an option on the table for the boards to consider of having two part time yeah. positions to avoid the cost of of the, the, of the benefits. Right. And it's a better bang for your buck. It gets you what you need, maybe temporarily. Maybe that's not the most ideal solution, but with the pending possible center coming on board and a new staffing plan being needed, it seems like a more reasonable stopgap at the moment. Right. And so the way that increase in the budget. And so the way that we'll roll that up significant for both boards is to say <laughs> this is the request. Okay. The request at the you know in, in a holistic view is is maybe not achievable for this year's budget. And I'm not saying that right. the board will make those decisions, but we'll present solutions to say, if this is not feasible, then like Mike said, we could do this at a cost of this. Okay. And if we can work that in, we'd go back to you as the department head and say, we can work this into the budget. Is this something you could work with? Okay. You know, that sort of thing. Not presenting one, is it, it's an all or nothing choice. Correct. So that, that's the thing. <laughs> that's what I asked. If yeah. that was going to be the way it was going to be approached, mm. could the position, instead of, 14 hours could it be 18 hours and so it would be two then i'd have two 18 hour positions that they could they could mirror one hypothetically, another and, i mean well yeah. hypothetically i mean it's a, but the the benefits is such a, a big chunk of it so I, but the, i guess it would make we'd have to see to the numbers that. for like 14 hours versus 18 hours because i but but it, it i feel like it wouldn't be as much of it difference okay. I mean, once you take out the i'd also like to know how we can if we are losing people to other communities how our staffing compares to other community okay. like sized communities and are like are we understaffed are we overstaffed okay. comparatively to other people and and what those positions are that's something i could work with hr on i will tell you the people that we've lost we haven't <laughs> lost them to other centers we've lost some right. other professional yeah. full-time yeah. professions okay. working at clark university uh, working at staples corporate offices so um, they're getting experience and exactly yeah. exactly bringing in two part-time with the possible opportunity of <clears throat> a bigger staffing plan now you've trained somebody by the way so and it even if the numbers didn't work out, it's a better value to the town to have two employees being able to fill this, I think, than paying one and paying benefits. Yeah. Do anything Thanks, else? Oh, are there yeah, any other questions for we really appreciate you staying for Thank you so much. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Bye. They I've got the best people. Like they work, they work their tails off. They do. So uh, then next up we have library. Thank you so much for uh, <laughs> sticking it out. I, the, you know, I remember, like, if They're you not mind, the most comfortable three hour chairs. You don't mind introducing yourself. I realize yeah, I have to stand it introduce it though. Like, oh, yeah, well, Dan shows up at yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, when you're ready, if you don't mind introducing yourself. Uh, Andrew Jenrick, I'm the director at the Taft Public Library. Uh, I actually have, <laughs> I have a lot of copies. Uh, <laughs> I didn't know how many would be here. So. This is also on the drive too. This This is on the drive. Yeah, it yeah, it is on SharePoint. So if you, it's great. So you I, I got it electronically. Thank you. Okay. <clears throat> I can do it. No, I'm very. <laughs> All right. 
Hello. Um, I'll try to make this um, as streamlined as possible. So what I decided to do was outside of just sort of going through page by page with you, just kind of boil it down, let you know um, where the differences are based on um, this last year's proposal. Um, so the major differences are in salaries. Uh, as you know, of course, we had an arrangement this past year whereby um, 11 hours uh, came from state aid and then the town um, took care of the benefits piece for the children's librarian. Uh, that's gone very well, by the way. Um, we've actually been able to expand programming, uh, an additional play group, an additional story time. Uh, we were maxed out on most of our um, uh, signups. So doing that, we've now been able to accommodate essentially everybody who had wanted to do programs and weren't able to in the, in the, in the previous year. So that's been good. Uh, the children's librarian is actually now able to do some of the things that are in the children's librarian's job description. Um, I should say additional things, which are to, which is to say uh, like collection development. Um, she's now taken over um, the collection development for the children's area, so that allows me to pull away from that and then focus on young adult and adult. Um, it also allowed her uh, additional prep time for programs, seeing as in like I said, two cases that actually doubled the numbers on on um, programs. Uh, and uh, she's had additional time uh, to promote programs, create publicity, uh, and then post on the library social media because she's essentially our social media person in uh, the library. Uh, and then also she's been able to chip in on things like supply ordering, adult programming, and so forth. Um, so the the uh, the proposal this year uh, asks for the eleven additional hours for the children's librarian position. Uh, to be covered by the town in FY25, uh, as opposed to funded through state aid. Um, it, uh, in other respects, isn't dramatically different. Um, we've asked again for nine additional work hours for library assistance. Um, resulting increase in open hours at the library, which I've described on pages four and five of the document, um, where we would um, potentially move from 30 hours per week, which is what we're open right now, to 42 hours per week. Um, uh, other than that, there are just uh, modest increases to three budget lines and operations, uh, programming, meetings and dues and books. Um, total increase to operations would be 2400. Uh, all other operations budget lines are level funded. Uh, met with uh, the treasurer and the town administrator uh, back in February. Um, it may look a little bit different from last year's proposal in that we moved uh, a, a fair amount from contracted services into building maintenance and into telephone, basically right sizing those accounts. <clears throat> Things that were coming out of contracted services should have been coming out of building maintenance. And that was just, you know, part and parcel of what the director had done ever since I had came into the position and those before me. Um, uh, all state budgetary requirements were met by the library in FY24. So um, we met the <clears throat> municipal appropriation requirement um, and the materials expenditure requirement, and it would be met uh, as well this year um, with the proposal for FY25. Um, let's see. You just, if you want to take a look at the last page, which is where the breakdown is. Uh, so the total budget is uh, 363,609, which uh, is 35,239 more than the previous year. So that's a 9.7% increase. Most of that is for the children's librarian and benefits. Um, like I said, 2,400 is for operations and 32,839 for salaries. Um, I can go through point by point if you want, but if everybody's had a chance to take a look at it, I can take questions. Let me know your thoughts. And the spreadsheet is that 
Are the numbers slightly different than yeah. the spreadsheet, or am uh, I looking at they that? They are slightly different. Okay. Is it the 363 on Oh, yeah, by 300? Yeah. It, I wonder if it's because we, hold on. The, the, the total oh, is 609. Yeah, I'm wondering it's if it was. Shame, so it maybe is just broken down differently in this page. So it it is the 300. Excuse me. We can look at that minutia. All right, that's okay. It's a, the bottom well, line is three hundred dollar discrepancy. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, so yeah. the numbers on our spreadsheets are good. So I, I think that I'm, I'm comfortable with that. Okay. It's the three sixty three three zero nine. Um, if it it's could not, be for the meetings of dues. That we can. Yep. Yeah. Get that. So, and I mean, I guess they, there is a three hundred dollar difference in right, the meeting okay. too. Yeah. Oh, in the meeting. Thank you. Two thousand dollars. Yeah. The difference. Oh, yeah. Was it? So do you want me to update that in here? Dues? Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, the the three hundred was added in. That's okay. I can update it easily. So the. the I feel like you know this. The question that comes up is you know for the the request for the nine additional right. hours. Um, I mean, I think that we we discussed this a bit as a board before about the eleven hours that you know we talked last year about the town taking that on. I think we, previous meeting we also indicated that that was the direction we were going, mm -hmm. but then the the nine additional hours. I guess we haven't talked about that to the same extent. So I guess in the spirit of like in that that's to go from 30 to 42 hours right and that would directly re related to increase yeah it would require um, additional hours uh for myself on the desk additional hours for the children's library on the desk it would be nice if we were a one floor building where that would solve a lot of issues but because we have two desks <clears throat> the reason we need to look at staff and staff hours is because i have to be right. able to staff both and so the, the nine hours safe. is what's is like that's the amount needed for the additional hours. Right, in order for it, yeah, to get us to like- Library it. open that right, additional. Right, hours. Monday, I would say one thing um, recently that Monday would be maybe a little more problematic, but the other days of the week, um, certainly I think would reflect what I've, what I have in the proposal. And the only reason I say Mondays is an issue is that I've had some, the staffing, a staffing issue or a staffing change in terms of a person's available. So if the hours are hours of operations remained at 30, right. you wouldn't need the nine hours. Uh, if it, I'm sorry, if, it rem if the hours of operation remained at 30? 30 versus 42, which is the proposal. Right. You do not need the nine additional hours for the assistant? Uh, well, the nine additional hours, I'm, I guess I'm trying to understand what you're- Well, you, you actually said that the nine additional hours you you pointed to the increased hours of operations the need the reason for increasing nine additional hours i'm just trying to if if that's yeah. not the case which is fine yeah i'm just trying to clarify do you need nine additional hours regardless if you're open 30 versus 42 hours we do need nine additional hours in the, in so so the 30 to 42 is is separate you need nine hours given current hours of operations of 30 hours right but nine additional library assistant hours right yeah. Right. Yeah. There's you've you've got and then the eleven and this might Jody might be a question for you. When we did split out the shared cost of the children's librarian last year, mm -hmm. the um the share that came from the library it, did, how did how was it represented on last year's budget? I guess is my question. Line item wise. So um it's actually on the revenue side. Um it's taken out of state aid. So the salary, right? But the uh, ah, so the benefits are in the budget. Were they in the they budget last the, year? They did, they did put the twenty thousand. Uh, I mean, that's what I was always told. Twenty thousand <laughs> benefits. That's in here for this year. Yes, but it was also in for last. Right. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to understand it, there's the no thirty-two thousand dollar increase. Oh, oh so because you, okay. it seems like the eleven hours and the benefits is year over year consistent. Why am I seeing a thirty-two thousand increase in salaries and wages? Unless it was a, that's why I thought yeah. it might have been a different line item somewhere. Oh, I got you. Hang on one second. I can answer that. While Jody's looking for that, um, you mentioned here that the uh, library, the children's librarian, is a second in command. Are you also looking for more leadership help? Is that? I mean, or is that just secondarily? <laughs> 
I mean, when I'm not there, she's. I think that was justification last year. Right. Too, it happened. Only have a second full time right. person right. also can right. elaborate. Because that's right. another part of the story that's important to tell. Like, right. That, right. I mean, that's administrative work that's important to the other employees at your right. business, right? But, yeah, but I also want to make sure pe people listening understand that the, the children's librarian has been in place through last year's budget. Through the chef. Yes, right. yes, absolutely. I'm sorry. So yeah, that, yeah. We brought that. We yeah, had the leadership that year. Yeah. Last right. year. One of the I'm big... new this year. Right. Yeah. So, yeah. Sorry. Right. <laughs> so I just got back. It's, right. it's good to fill in the gaps. Okay. For, yeah. So I can tell you. For people following along. Okay. Too. Yeah, that's okay. So the 32,839 number represents three items. Number one, contractual increases to just the library director's salary. Number two, the nine additional library assistant hours at the current rate of pay. And number three, the 11 additional hours that were in that um, state aid was leveraged for last year in the budget. That, yeah. Those hours that would now become part of right, this So budget. those 11 hours were covered by state aid. Correct. But, but now I, this is baked in here. Right. Right, but on the expense side in last year's budget, wouldn't we have still seen it in under salary, regardless of the funding yep. source? Yep. Right? Yep. Um, okay, I'm good. I just need those, either, really the nine hours, just to me, I don't want to understand the specific line item, because everything else is contractual or already there. It's just a, an accounting right. situation. Yeah. The nine hours is really the only incremental increase I see here. Is that fair? I think that's fair. Uh, aside from the contractual, I mean, you're, the, <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's an, that's a contractual increase, but the 11 hours and the benefits should the be. The benefits zero. were in here, the 11 hours were not. Right, yeah, it's, it's essentially the responsibility of the 11 fell to state aid this past year. No, no, I, so now it's we, not we, the only the portion of her salary that was funded initially in the budget was yeah. in here for last year. The 11 hours was not represented in but salaries benefits last were. year. Benefits were. Benefits were. Because it references full-time benefits here. So that really is not a change that was already in our budget last Correct. year. Correct. So Correct. nine hours and 11 hours are the two incremental increases on that line item. Yep. Plus the, Aside from the contract. library director's yeah. contract. Well, I don't mean to ignore it. <laughs> <laughs> if you know, I mean, right. I, it like honestly a, shouldn't be. Right. The, right. The, the yeah. The thousand is in there. So this full time year, benefits but. were already included in last year's yeah. budget. And so they are still included in this year's yeah. budget. Right. I'm good. Yeah. So that, so I, I know what you're saying. So, so that number at the 197, are you saying that you put that? Um, you added twenty thousand dollars to that. I did put that in. Okay, so that we need to go back and scrub a little bit because I know what you're saying, Mike. Um, it won't be a thirty-two thousand dollar increase. Then it will be well, less than that. It will be six fourteen six thirty nine plus another. And, and the eleven we've already committed to, in my mind, to uh, the, Elena, to your point. So to right. me, nine is the decision point unless we have some budget issue where we've got to figure out why right. we can't cover the 11. And then as far as the nine, I guess in the interest of you know, trying to figure out where we can be incremental, right. is there a, another number of hours? I mean, would right. some number of hours still be useful if we absolutely. can't manage this yeah, the nine, like, sure. you know, four or five? Like, yeah, I, I, it, if it was a, a situation where we could continue to increase our hours incrementally for patrons mm -hmm. absolutely i don't you know do you have like days of the week you're aiming to hit i i definitely like to have us uh be open an additional hour uh tuesdays wednesdays and thursday nights most people tell us that when they get home at six they can't get over there by seven so we're open till eight i think that's a, you would be useful uh, i think on the weekend it would be nice for us to potentially open for another hour or two um and where you right now at not, uh, from nine to noon it would be nice if we were to say 10 to 2 or 10 to 3 i think um Mondays we've been without for so long that I, I don't know that there's been a, a huge clamor for Mondays. We I actually um, uh, we did take a sort of a informal poll, and Mondays did not come up as often. I think a lot of people move their business to Tuesdays, but that doesn't necessarily mean that people wouldn't like us to be open on Mondays. But I would say the first priority for us would be um, uh, evening hours, greater evening hours, say Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. 
uh, and then certainly additional hours on the weekend. So how, what is the correspondence between additional assistant hours and additional library opening hours? Like yeah. how, do you, how many for like one other open hour, how many assistant hours do you need? Is it like a one to one? Uh, it's, like two, it's more it's hours exactly, I need two more hours for, for, one, for one additional, exactly, okay. for one additional hour. Uh, in most cases, like in some cases, I might be able to fill in at a desk for right. part of the time or the children's librarian, but also understand that, I mean, as much as we do do desk hours because we think it's important, there are things that are important for us to be working on that aren't necessarily time spent at the desk checking out materials. And my apologies about the 20,000. It, 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 last year it was in, so I, I think right, I just right, put well, it in there, yeah, I'm glad you asked my definition of call that. That's why we're having these discussions. So that, it, yeah, so, and then, uh, so are there any other questions for Andrew? No, he's nope. very helpful. Thank right, you. Thank you so much. Sure. Thank, thank you, you for yeah, your yeah. Patience, waiting. Like, no, yeah. please, no, <laughs> it's no problem. If you have questions and need to email me or. I just want to throw this out. Next year's budget cycle, library goes first. Is that fair? <laughs> yeah, that's true. We keep yeah, like, and you, you drew the short straw this. No, that's all right. I, I appreciate your time. Thank you so much. So, all right. So, uh, sure. that that was the end of our budget presentations, unless I overlooked anyone. Um, so, I think I would like to um, jump ahead to item seven the safer grant because our um fire chief has also been waiting here patiently for hours so i presented during our budget session the increase in staffing over the years yep it came up that there's a grant opportunity it's called the staffing for adequate fire and emergency response it's a three year, no cost share grant, but after the three years, the town would incur the cost of the firefighters that would be hired. Um, it emailed Jody the notice of funding, which is 79 pages. Is that what it's been? No, <laughs> short document. Yeah. Um, so the basis of this, they want to try to staff fire departments to meet a standard, which is standard 7.10. I didn't make too many copies, but that was around. It basically says how many people need to be at a fire initially. And it's not up, there's two pages per day. No. No. It doesn't have to be at getting it 100%. The grant needs to prove that you're working towards getting towards the goal of meeting it as a percentage. Recently there's there's the grant closes on the 12th, so I'd have to have that submitted by then the 12th of April. They'll start getting the grant awards out in July, the end of July. And there's 30 uh, 323 million dollars that they're giving for this grant for mm -hmm. Hiring purposes. And once they start giving them out, they give them out until they run out of money. Yep. Some departments get $25 million for it. The numbers I threw out there, depending on where we wanted to put it at, would be either 1.1 1 .1 or 1.7 million for the whole brain. If we were to go for the three a shift, it would be better down the road for us to be able to meet that a little easier for the cost, but it wouldn't prove that we're getting closer to meeting the NFPA standard. So it's a fine line whether yeah. they're going to give the less amount or if you're trying to get close to the, the funding. Uh, there have been some local departments that have got it within the last four years. Uh, Dudley, Spencer, Westminster, Webster, Millis, Rentham, Hopkinton, Ashland, Auburn, Norfolk, and Oakland, all kind of around the same size department. Some are a little bigger, some are a little smaller, but they have all gotten an award in the past. Usually there's the Worcesters in there that get 24 million. Boston gets it almost every year somehow. So 
So I was just get open to any other funding by meeting these requirements. Like, does that open anything up else afterwards? Not really. They're not requirements. NFPA is not a law. It's just a I they write it as requirements. I'm just yeah, it's <laughs> that it's not a requirement. NFPA is a recommendation. It's not law, but it's in the court of law. It will hold up as a law. So it's it's tough to try to meet all of the regulations they have, but trying to meet a standard to get more firefighters to a scene sooner is what they're trying to accomplish with this grant process. I do have a firefighter that his wife is actually a published author and she's more than willing to help write the narrative for the grant. So she's on board with that. She wants her husband working with more people per shift. So she's on board with trying to write it. You have to fit it in a certain amount of characters within it. So it's tough to get everything you want into the narrative and meet the 4,000 character limit. I mean, my concern is with the way all of our financial woes are going. This grant is done. We are on the hook. Right. I don't know how we put in place a support system financially to be prepared for that. Well, that's why I wanted to bring it to the board. I don't <laughs> want to put in for it, and I'd hate to hire people in three years. We have to like, yeah, it wouldn't, be, wouldn't be worth. It. Can you just walk through the numbers again in terms of the number of hires and so also and related to you've walked us through yeah. the budget presentation of this time print this i didn't print yeah. off any for you guys but um if we were to get to the three a shift we would need to hire four additional firefighters to get to four a shift it would be seven firefighters so and that's would be they pay for the salary and benefits. They don't cover any overtime, but with the increased staffing, the overtime would instead reduce a little bit. Uh, it wouldn't be all paramedics. We could get away with hiring some basics, which is slightly cheaper per person. Uh, an EMT is 94,000, including the benefits, and a medic is 100,000, including the 30,000 mm -hmm. for the benefits. Is there any savings from like, having to pull in part-time staff to cover a station and stuff like there that? There would be some savings in that. It, it's, it's tough to tell because it's all flip to a coin. Right. Yeah. So when we're going to get people, we're actually looked at the numbers earlier today and the, this time last year, we're about 50 calls higher than we were last year. So it's, so we're getting busier. We're going to more fires, more mutually aid calls. We're at a fire until midnight last night over in Selville. So, so how so how many um, like how many people were you hoping to fund? I mean, is there some like is is this something that can be incremental? Is like do they offer so, the grants for like one position, or do they really they're really trying to? They like, want to push it towards. Getting closer to it. Right. We don't have to meet it, but right. I was I was thinking we would go for the three a shift, which is the 12, 12 career members. Mm -hmm. So that would get us to the next step in the staged approach that I presented during the budget. And just move that. And the way their schedule the career member schedules work, it's you, if you put one person in, it really doesn't make any benefit because okay. one shift like twice a week would have more people on it. it hiring in groups brings up the staffing across the board a little, a little bit. But, but the I mean, I think you now we're talking between four and five hundred thousand dollars. We we would have to meet for a three shift in three years, right? As opposed three eighty nine four twenty four. What if you hire all EMTs? Aren't they all going to be over a buck, a like hundred thousand? It would be. The 94 piece, but we would only have five paramedics at that point in the workload. The no, most of our paramedic call 100,000. Yeah. <laughs> because at the end of three years, those salaries are going to go will, up. Step increases okay. as well. I didn't uh, factor that in. That's just the. But you don't see any benefit in going after a, a an additional firefighter. And, and the incremental approach to me would be adding. If I put, if I put in the grant for one firefighter, we would not get it. Okay. There's. 
no shot. Oh, that's really higher. Yeah. They they probably wouldn't. They want to see across the board. They have like KPIs for you know measuring a decrease in I don't know accent. Like, is there a way to measure the value to the community after three years of increased? Firefighter no, level call response time. More staffing. We would be able to staff our second ambulance, which we're getting delivered in October. Do these four yeah. second or four minute response time things. Yeah. And the response times, it's there's plenty of studies out there. I can share them with you if you'd like. They're very in depth. There's the National Institute of Science and Technology has a firefighting branch where they just study fires. That's I'm more looking for like how we justify the the value we obtain by increasing our staffing like how we show that i mean i, I don't it doesn't take a lot to get to a point of understanding why staffing firefighters at a higher level is beneficial to a town right it just but at the end of the day there's only so much money and that is a huge yeah that is a big step change that we are not prepared to take and i don't see us being prepared to take in three years especially with assets that are coming to the town Fiscal cliffs that are pointing us directly in the face, right? I mean, look, so, yeah. <laughs> no, no, I, mean, I, I, I agree. I, the, the plus four was. I was. I was looking for more incremental, like a firefighter. Yeah, there would be some benefit to that, but yeah, we couldn't do four in three years. Yeah, no way. Uh, unless we don't do anything else anywhere else, right? Right. So. I mean, there would be a slight what, increase what in revenue is. from our ambulance billing okay. right now. I think we're at maybe 228 this year so far. You're really testing me. Yeah. <laughs> so okay. staffing the second ambulance with that would increase a little bit. It would be a huge increase. Increase call volume. Could get a little closer, but it wouldn't be. Yeah, we estimate about two and a quarter for ambulance revenue. I think we're coming a little bit higher than that. Build out, I want to say 228 already this year. Yeah. So yep. it's close to that. Grant seems sort of cruel. It's like they want, yeah. it's like but we the, can give we, you yeah. Put in, yeah. Yeah. in three years, I could put in for it again. But okay. that's what they give right. it. But they there is departments the that they put in for it multiple times. And okay. And did they, they, they get it? it? Apparently, Boston does. Sorry, is that what? Okay. Worcester does. Shocking. <laughs> they get the. Yeah. yeah. So you wouldn't think about going for two, huh? I could. I would put in for it. I don't know how. Well, no, but, but think about the cyclical no, I, nature. I mean, two now, two again. I mean, I, do I think could we bridge two full time? But I understand with, with how the shifts work, like it, it doesn't become as beneficial as it seems, right? It's not like just during the day you end up having. You know, oh, I've got two extra people for eight hours it's a more of a long term. Yeah, payoff. but it yeah. almost seems, and correct me if I'm wrong, that the more the better that you put in for. Yeah. So if you put in for one, no shot. Two, you might have ten percent chance. You but now we get to four, then you've got a lot of comfortable with layoffs in three years. Right. Right. Partial. No. No. And that's two, I think instead of four, but I mean that's yeah. right. It, untenable it's position it's for the chief. The you know, potential opportunities yeah, for an with another town. Unless that's what you want. Certain resources. Yeah, I like mean, in other words, hey, I'm hiring for. I'm I'm about to hire you as a firefighter. There's a very good yeah, chance. Of you know. Yeah, right. <laughs> Unless we're lucky enough to get the grant again. Yeah. Right. I mean, it's. Well, right. I don't know. Yeah, yeah that's true. Yeah. I think you could secure two over three years. How many people were you going to ask for next year? Yes, for one. I asked for one for next year. Right, right. I, that one. But then the net, the, were you thinking out to 2026 or? I hadn't thought of how many I was going to ask for next year yet. Just yeah. see how this year goes. And <laughs> <laughs> I have my plan laid out where we'd like to get in the future. How long we get there? Well, the plus one would be minus one. So for the, three years. The fun thing with that, they have to be assigned to a fire apparatus. So if we hired a fire inspector, it's not qualified under this. Okay. So it, it's a little <laughs> caveat they have it. It's luckily yeah, just buy some truck. They're trying <laughs> to staff that. So it's it's is this grant available every year? Yeah. Until the money run though. They just cut 10% from it for next year in some of the cuts they just made. Mm -hmm. 
and it has been available for I want to say at least eight years, eight or nine years. So I can put in for two, see how it works. Open to and try it. The, what's the deadline? The 12th, April 12th. I think it's worth at least the practice mm -hmm. for next year. Most of the, see the, how they the grant process is very similar to the AFG grant that I put in for the air cascade system. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to be able to just move those right over. It's just the narratives that will be time consuming and someone else pretty volunteered to okay. do that for me. So I guess, is there a way that we could like increase the budget? I mean, two years or three years isn't that much time to increase the budget gradually, but to prepare for that like cliff of the grant money falling off. But I mean, <laughs> but it's still, I mean, right, if we're, it's still. Fire it's and not that doesn't much. get cheaper every year, right? No, I mean, no. You're, you're looking but at I mean, about 100,500 100, just to bring on a fire prevention person, you know. Um, so if you're looking at three times that at a higher caliber, that's a lot more. And if and if we wanted to keep and unfortunately it's an all or nothing, right? Like you can't step someone from part time and sprinkle it into the budget and then increase their hours and then increase their capacity. Like it's a you got them. <laughs> and we're not taking on any revenue. Like we're not charging anybody for our. We would be or for ambulance revenues. Right, just saying, yeah. We get revenue for the ambulance. But I mean, the offset is probably minimal. Yeah. I mean, this would be looking at our projected growth. Yeah. And you just like we did with library saying this much of new yeah. growth, we have to allocate here over the next three yeah, years to cover this commitment we've just made. Right. I mean, that's the reality. Yeah. I mean, what was our new growth this year? I think we already right. committed some of that new growth to the each group, right? But it wasn't no, was this year. Oh, right. Right. Oh, okay. yeah. But I think it's, but it's like still. Yeah, he came he came in early. He said, mm -hmm. I'm tying up my roof now. <laughs> yeah, you came in early. The point of asking for two is Mike. what harm is that? Is what because right if now? that's three years and he was you're gonna have for one next year. And in three years, I don't think it would have been unreasonable to ask for right. another one. I'm gonna I'm gonna say it now. Yeah. The re the reality is, I would probably think we we're gonna be talking about an operational override either next year or the year after for the town. Right. And and yeah. with I mean, what we're doing with public works, right. just pulled in compensation studies. I mean, we're yeah. Right. You know what so, I mean? so this was how many? How, I'm sorry. How many positions? And what would the expected uh, possible salaries be once the grant rolls off? So. Three positions at 398 is what you said. It would be four positions at. Okay. Two of them would be 94. Two of them would be. Okay. Say, say 400. Even it up. Yeah. Make it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So almost 100% of two fiscal years worth of new growth would essentially need to be put aside mm -hmm. to fund this. And well, that, that's new growth, but then yeah. it's also there's also the levy too, right? I mean. Did that? Did you look the levy and new growth, or just the new growth? Numbers? I was just looking at the new growth. Yeah. Right. So, but so I mean, we have. I guess my point is, we know. To your point, we've sort of got a. a we should be able to project out two or three years of what our increased levy slash new growth is going to look like. Yeah. Right. And do we think it's feasible? I think it's worth an exercise to look at that and maybe start the person practicing for the grant. Right. I mean. If um, this year for two, you'll be that much closer. Like if it doesn't yep. get funded, the groundwork could be reused. Like potentially the narrative could okay. be just reframed. Yeah, I'm going back to what's for honestly. Really? Yeah, I mean, well. <laughs> no, because no, I, I honestly think and people are going to like, oh, over, there's that override word again. But the, the reality is, I said this last year that to do the things we've talked about doing, we do need to kind of look at the town operations budget and that we're coming to. Yes. I mean, a budget exclusion vote is going to need to come um, should the center pass, right? So what? Isn't that exclusion? Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah, that exclusion. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yes. It's going to be, yeah, this. Yeah, so I mean, we're talking lots of votes over the next few years that people are not going to want to stomach. <laughs> but this would be, let's say, 
if it was true and you got it, that's something we don't have to worry about for three years, correct? Yeah. Mm -hmm. That you blank it three years later. <laughs> Not blank like, ten, but three years, years because it's like, oh, it's a three-year term. It'll be someone else's head. Phased <laughs> <laughs> in approach to it, and I think it was last year, or the year before, they just did. Yeah, this all or nothing approach makes it really difficult yeah, to, to stop really wedge. Is, is there yeah. in years two and three? There's a not anymore. No, they away with that. It used to be the. Like certain seventy five percent, they paid seventy five percent the second year. Yeah, all right, that's no third year, and now they just pay a hundred percent for three years. Oh, okay. Is good, but it's, it's a fascinating for years. Um, yeah, it sounds great on the surface. I would want to do some sort of number crunching on what the the right. revenue and levies look like and the ability to be able to fund this in the future in regards to everything else before we just like up and accept it. I could uh, put in for all of it and when if we get awarded the grant, the town votes yeah. not to accept it at that point. You're not going to get a revenue projection in 12 days. To... I know. No, no, but I, but I think that a multi-year forecast is kind of the next thing on the financial mm -hmm. side of the house. We get, it's time. We got the capital framework in place. We've got our annual budget. Yeah, kind of closing on it. Everything. Feel pretty good about that. Multi-year forecast is the next thing we have to do, right? Yeah. She's ignoring me. Soon. <laughs> no, I have a revenue projection all the way through twenty. Yeah, thirty-six. I mean, I mean it, it, it's not a hard exercise because you're just kind of saying what do we think is reasonable, right? So yeah, yeah. The, the yeah. only thing that's variable is is new growth, and that's strictly. Jody, you need to put it in stone and in blood. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> put in the next yeah. contract. Yeah, exactly. So, um, but yeah, I mean that that's all projections are. Is you use your crystal ball, and sometimes it's foggy, and sometimes it's clear. But um, do, you, do you think we um, move forward with the exercise and reconvening? Well, the twelfth to say. Yeah. I like the idea of moving forward with the exercise, but I think we just need to think about what it really means. Should it? Should should we? Be careful the, what you ask for. You just might get it. It right? is a very competitive grant, so <laughs> yes, getting it is not. So oh, you should have led with else. that. But <laughs> I was looking at. The, oh well, in we that case, high <laughs> in all of the categories. Yeah. Yeah. But, well, you know what? It's a great opportunity for feedback as well in the writing and oh, the middle. Yeah, and I mean, a lot of not for anything else. A lot of times with grants, people don't get it the first time around, right. but oh, yeah. with the feedback, you get the yeah. scoring on it. Then. Yeah. A lot of times you can say, "How did they score?" Yeah. And then you see the where the the, the def deficiencies were in the yeah. grant application. If you have a willing party, correct it's those in the next round, and then we'll see what happens, and then. You know, it could, that we know yeah. that you're deficient as well. So, so. what do you need from <laughs> what do you want? <laughs> 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 A little bit of support. Yeah, I don't need to yeah. vote or anything, just I mean, conversation. I think, you know, yeah, where we stand. And like, no, I like the conversation. I'm glad to bring it yeah. up. Yeah. I just look at it as what's the worst that happens if he does it and we get it. Right. No well, like you said, we've no. been rejected. That's right. Could, yeah, but, yeah. but at that point, too, we could look and say, well, you know, we definitely need one position next year. Mm -hmm. and in three years, you know, projected to gain quote. But if we do get it and it comes to a vote, I want to make sure that the FinCom, at a bare minimum, has the ability to recommend to the town whether, hey, when you actually look this far out, this is the way we believe that you, this is our recommendation to the town, right? Um, so, <laughs> would also for Ben Tom have that as well. <laughs> now, when when do they decide? Like, how? so they start giving them out uh, July thirty first, and they just keep giving them out until they run out money. Out. Okay. I say we we move forward with it. Okay. We do it. I recommend. Forward. Do we need a motion, or do we just want to like? I don't think we need to talk. Yeah. yeah. All right. Yeah. So I just I mean, but are we going to talk about this. this again in a meeting before the twelfth? Or do we do we need to? You know. need us to. I, I would like to track now the the exercise of assessing our ability to do it financially. Yeah. Like let's not let's not just submit it on the twelfth and not get back to it till September. Right. So, but yes, yeah. right. That's going to be post ATM. 
Right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, I'd say post budget. Right. Once we close the balance of budget. We'll see to you. <laughs> <laughs> Let us come up for air, Mike. All right. So any more questions? So thank you so much. Thanks for having all right. So now we have left on the agenda review the ATM warrant, consider the ballot question, town administrator report. So, bit uh, opening tomorrow. What's that? Bit opening on the record room tomorrow. Oh, okay. Um, so the, the, um, are we going to do the warrant? So we're not going to go through the full. Warrant, but actually we do like, uh, I guess, are you going to have a budget hearing meeting and for the for the FinCom? Yeah, that's yeah, right. once and once like, everything's all set, we're, we're going to schedule um, a budget hearing to the calendar. I've shared the calendar I'm of when the budget hearing would be. Yeah, so just make sure it's posted and yeah. you're good to go. And then I mean. It would be nice if that were a joint meeting with the select board also. I think it's been done that way some years. Yeah, I think that's what we did last year. Yeah. yeah. So. so yeah. You guys voted and then we voted. <laughs> right. Yeah. So, yeah, so the town meeting warrant, I know, I guess we could probably talk about it pretty quickly. It's, I think uh, we have another week before we need like drop dead date. I think April 9th is drop dead date for printing. Um, so Tuesday. I think what's that Tuesday, April 9th. Did you just say? Well, so I, I know April 9th is the drop dead date for the ballot printing. Um, and I think that the, um, for the warrant, I just know April 10th is a, is a Wednesday cause it's my anniversary. Oh, okay. But, um, I think, I think that the, <laughs> the ATM. Well, I don't, so, so what we'd have to so finish up next week. That's what. Oh, I'm right. Have you guys looked at the um, the the calendar that kind of carves all this out? Do you want me to bring it up? Sure. Yeah. I, I, mean, I don't know if that would be helpful or not. Yes, that would but, be helpful. Okay. Just so we're not guessing. And and again, this is what what we kind of mapped out for everybody. Um, it's in the shared drive as well. But essentially, you know, the budget calendar for the rest of the time here so obviously this is tonight's meeting um so the next meeting we would be looking at april 3rd uh prepare and distribute the atm warrant to the select board and fincom um again the financial team will be presenting a draft balanced budget recommendation to both the select board and fincom the 10th uh, a few things happening there distributing the final warrant voting on the finalized ATM warrant articles, presenting the final balance budget recommendations, voting on the final budget, and then um, the public hearing. This was a TBD mic, so we can look at what you want to do there. Yep. And then the 18th is when we'd post the ATM warrant and the meeting notification with the clerk. Um, between there, this is a date down here. It's just more some notes. The budget book will need to be sent to the printer no later than 422. I worked with this date with Laura. Um, on the 25th would be the town moderator would be walking through the warrant um, with uh, citizens. So that will be another meeting that will be scheduled for that. And then we roll right into ATM on 5-3. So that's really what we're looking at for the next the next month. OK, well, so I know like for the ballot language, we need to have that for Ellen by April 9th at the latest. and. I guess to some extent are the sure. warrant article related to the senior center and the the ballot language need to be like mesh. So like and I think we like I don't know. Yeah, I feel like we need town council to like Yeah, so there's another go note ahead for like this is what you plop into both. Yeah, so um I didn't have that date, so thank you for that. Um I had a note here that after the select board votes to finalize the warrant, the warrant will need to be sent to town council. So once town council gets it, that will be that will be after the tenth. But you're saying that Ellen well, needs it. Yeah, minutes. I was asking Ellen when she needs to have okay. the ballot language because okay. she is going to be planning to send out ballots. I think April sixteenth for the. So I think Laura was planning on, and so maybe this is just a matter of connecting offline on the dates between the clerk yeah. and 
um, and Laura, but my understanding was that after the select board and FinCom finalize the warrant articles um, and vote on it, then it would be sent to right. town council. So, yes. So I think with most of the most of the articles, we have more flexibility about. Or more flexibility about the timing. Tara sent back the senior center article today okay. with additional okay. language. Right. Uh, okay. Redlined in it today. Yeah, I'm looking at it. Right. And Ellen sent us the template right. ballot language. But it, so has, it has like a space for like specify purpose of it. So I think I guess my I have my Council my question to, yeah to, is yeah. like what is the specific, you know, language that we put into that. I think yeah, I, I bet they usually consult with bond council okay. to make sure that the language will be in accordance with what our, you know, who we're going to borrow from in okay. terms of how, how it's defined and how it's going to be spent. Have you, Mike, have you talked with town council? I know you talked with her about the, the warrant article language, but have you talked with her directly about the ballot? ballot? No, last week she basically said talk to Ellen. She was here. Okay. All right. <laughs> and well, then so, like, Ellen sent the the template. So right. And yeah, I, yeah. I talked to Laura a bit later. So I mean, clearly, we, yeah, some dots need to be connected. So. Yeah. I mean, I think the warrant's probably fine. I think we just send this warrant article with the ballot language, put our words in there, say, "Kara, right. so right. yeah. and she can yeah. redline it." Okay. Yeah. So yeah, to some extent, I guess we so do we uh, do people want to go through the changes to the warrant? I know Karis just recently sent some edits. I, I mean, I, I have no I, looking at her changes. It's all legalese to me. It just doesn't really change the intent of the right. articles that were on there. Right. Um, but I did want to confirm we were going to take remove the article number 20, which is capturing the um, Excess debt, the 343, we're going to take that off the warrant. I thought we did talk about, yeah. We, I just want to confirm. It's just we have marked as being removed. It hasn't okay. been removed yet. Okay. So remove number 20. 20. 21 is still there. This is one time payout. Jody, it's an article to maybe take it from free cash or somewhere mm -hmm. to. Yeah, you can leave it on there. Okay. And this is just the retirement, the vacation payouts rather. And I'll, yeah, I'll just say this in a in a scenario where we don't have such a budget crunch. My first option would be to keep it as a line item because year after year you're going to have retirees. I wouldn't necessarily try to bake it into operational for a large amount for one year, um, but kind of seeding that over time so that we're not we're 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 planning for it, mm -hmm. but there's no problem whatsoever with leveraging free cash or another I, source. I just so. want to use, leave the negotiations yep. line as big as we can leave it. Yep. Okay. Even in, in the most the recent update, I saw, I think you still had when I, uh, actually on the spreadsheet I was looking at tonight, yep. you still had. I did. It's still in there. I started working on on so the line today, so I left. I didn't want to make any changes before tonight. Okay. Um, but, but so that number is still the number we're playing with that. Yep. The one, whatever. Yeah. Yep. Okay. And then the only other thing I'd say, did anybody have any comments on the ordering of articles? Because I got some feedback from Ellen. One change that I would make sense. She moved. She says she grouped consent calendar items together. So like article 16, she moved up so I can make that change. Otherwise, she was fine with the document I, I had shared. So if anyone has not looked at it. I don't have any disagreements. Okay. It does need to be chunked. That's a technical term, right? Sean? I mean, I didn't want to give it to tell Laura to make any changes. And I have to make changes again, but if everyone's comfortable with it, I can just say, let's make these changes now. Because yeah. if Phil doesn't seem to see the senior center further higher up on the art warrant, he's going to come after that. <laughs> right. And it's okay. So. Right. So. And very good if I just yeah the reordering you talked about made sense. Okay, so yes, you. I'll send it to her tomorrow, and she can next time we see this it'll right. be and changed. You'll mention the remove the yeah yeah yep twenty is what I wrote down. Yep, she she has it marked there because I said it's probably going to be removed, but I'm not going to say that until Jody returns. Right, since there might have been there was yeah. yeah. 
there were a couple that was like, oh, take it off, put it on, put it on, take it off. I, I would leave, leave it there until the very possible. If we decide that we can remove it, great. If not, I would just proceed with it. It's true. I mean, it could always, could even always get passed over because we can't do anything without the ballot. Who are we talking about? But the the funding. Yeah. Oh, the what one? The the debt capture is that what we're talking no. about? No. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Capture, and that you agree the debt capture. You're talking about the one-time payment. Yeah, the one-time payment. Yeah. Okay. The debt capture. The debt we capture, can just take off because it was strategically taken off. Right. Yes. 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 It, it's still in a scenario ground, where we would not be going for a project. I would highly recommend it stay right. yeah, and right. capture it. But we're going for a project, right. and so therefore yeah. we're going to take. Yes. We're going to take. Okay. It. Great. So it, that one is well, what that was more of a strategic yeah. decision. Then we're going to have debt next year with the school, so it'll just jump right back on. <laughs> then there's a um, an item that didn't get added. We, we talked about last week adding an article to move some free cash into FinCom Reserve. So, the, so I'll make sure that gets added. The amount TBD because I don't think we've talked about an amount. Uh, we said seventy five, right? Yeah. Well, that was for your budget. Yeah. Oh yeah. What I'm budget. saying is just move some free cash. Oh yeah, yeah. May and June of this year, in case yeah. we need. Something happens. Yeah, we have access to it. Yep. Then I'll just roll the free cash. Yep. Yep. Going to revisit it again uh, next week. For the last time, it'll be done. <laughs> and then just oh, and and as far as the consider ballot question, just for you know the record, we have the appendix A proposition two and a half ballot question form sent to us by Ellen. Clerk and the budget, or sorry, the, the the ballot language is very constrained. So, like there there are basic there's basically one choice of how we want to do it, which is, I believe, the debt exclusion, um, and then because there's like levy limit override, levy limit underwrite, definitely not yeah. that one. Capital expenditure exclusion, which is the one I think that we were talking about, but decided not to said so that then there's debt exclusion. Um, and then, but there's, right, it's shall the city of, or city slash town of blank be allowed to exempt from the provision provisions of proposition two and one half, so-called the amounts required to pay for the bond issued in order to and then in parentheses, state the purpose or purposes for which the monies from the local issue will be issued, will be used. And so that's the part that we need council to say, like, yeah, we need the exact language for inside that parentheses. And I think we're going to just probably copy the warrant to design and construct right. and amend your senior community center to be located in the town on right. property, blah, blah, blah. Okay. So we'll like a first a pass, yeah. send a Karis, drop it in from the warrant article you into the Paris? And, and, yeah, yeah and she can say I would have liked to be a fly on the wall when they created that template and thought this would be really clear for voters <laughs> <laughs> all right so all right so then all we have left on here is town administrator report um elena yes uh hi it's ann i just have a comment on the warrant oh okay Thank you. Um, on Article 31, um, Karis took out um, the the line that says a uh, portion to be reimbursed by grants and other funding. And she was saying it's just too much detail for the article, but I think it's kind of important to have in there because it sounds like we're spending $1,800,000 and we're not. <clears throat> We'd be we, we just have to set aside the money um, but, but we'd I mean, I think it can go in the motion, though. Right, but I'm just thinking for the article when people read it, it's you know it'll probably be more in the range that the town would be spending like five hundred thousand, or maybe more than that. But a lot of it's going to be from grants and hopefully other um, sources. So, yeah, I I don't know like the specific reasons that Karis took that out so like i feel like we, we probably need to ask her like yeah she said it's too much detail for an, the article so if, if it's right um, but i mean i don't think it's like a legal reason um okay. but um so okay. just so i so just think it explains it we should probably confirm that with and, and if you like summarize your concerns could you ask her for a suggestion on how to address those concerns um ask Karis. yes 
Or like yeah, yeah, I could do that. I mean, okay. Do you wanna, I think you just have to say the same thing you just said to us. Exactly. Like, hey, they, they, this is what I was trying to do with that. How would you suggest we do that within the constrictions of this? Yeah, I want to just say up to one point eight. Yeah. yeah, I think you have to have a specific amount, um, but I don't know. Yeah, I think maybe. the concern would be the same, right? We spent a whole bunch of money to get the property. Now we're spending a whole bunch of money, which is a, they're all really big numbers. <laughs> yeah, exactly. To make it a certain type of area. <laughs> yeah, I, I think that Karis is probably just going to say it's too much detail for the article. So, yeah, I mean, I guess yeah. we can... Yeah, and I think the, the thing I'm thinking about here is sometimes you do a contingency, but this really isn't contingent. If we don't get the grants, the, the intent is still to uh, get that CR purchase, right? The developmental rights. Not necessarily. I, I'm, I'm, you know, we're kind of, it's kind of dependent on the grant. So you, all right, so you're not, you're not intending to spend the 1.8. No. So you could say. You could probably have wording that would be contingent upon, you know, um, the, you know, citing the grants you're going for. Right. I mean, it has all the wording because of this land grant that we're going to be applying for. And um, originally, CARES did put in the, uh, you know, a portion to be reimbursed by grants and other funding. But then when she, you know, looked at it again, she took it out because it was too detailed. So. I mean, well, I mean, I'm, I think we, we can have an opinion on that if collectively we think it makes more sense to have the detail not to scare people off mm -hmm. unnecessarily until we get to the floor. Well, you that know. was sort of my request, I guess, you know, right. and if you right. think we should leave it as it is, we'll leave well, it as it is, you know. But I mean, I, I guess I'm open to changing it, like, but with, you know, making sure, like, I guess. I'm open to having the conversation with Karis to see if like, you know, like. I don't think we want to change it against councils. No, like, no, she, she explicit advice. I mean, suggestion versus advice. I mean, I, right, right, yeah. like, is it a yeah. suggestion because she thinks it would be or better or choice? like legal advice? Yeah. yeah, if she personally feels like it's too verbose. Right. Thank you. Right. But there's a purpose. Right. So uh, if there's legally a reason to not do it, that's different. Yeah, could you send a just uh, send email the original wording that you that you had? Just I, I'm going to look for an old warrant, but it's right. It's it's so in the, it is. In yeah. the email. Yeah, I can send. Sentence. I can okay. send it. With I got the, it. Um, okay. You get hard copy. So check. So I guess my question is: Is did you want me to ask Karis, or did you want to ask Karis? Anybody talking to Karis about this already? <laughs> well, we, not. We, we have to we have to send Karis the ballot language. Right. Okay. Well, uh, right. I guess I feel like and we should probably ask, but maybe okay. could you could you email us like summarize the the points that you just said? Yes. And email yeah. us, and then we can follow up with Karis. That sounds good. I'll do that. Chances are we'll have other questions, right? Because as you said, <laughs> we have that ballot ballot question question. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Anne. Thanks, Anne. So she officially waited the longest. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll see. That's right. <laughs> oh, oh, okay. All right. So, um, yeah, you can still re So, uh, I believe, and let me know if I overlooked something. I believe we're up to a town administrator report. You did not overlook anything. Yeah, all right. I, I think you so, made this update earlier about the record term, right? Record term. Is right. Good yeah. opening. Bidding. Tomorrow. Great. Yeah. Noon. Hey. And, and I had like it, about eight people take a look at it. So that's one fingers crossed. That's exciting. And this, but this is your last meeting with us. So you're, is, you're yeah. working through the, the 30th or, 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 or this is it. Yeah, but this this is, is it. it. There's yeah. maybe, maybe tomorrow. Yeah, I'm going to be here tomorrow. You know, Greg's coming down and so you're going to jump on a Zoom meeting here and there. Just see how we're doing. Do Come on. <laughs> I'm going to be working with, with Greg currently. 
okay. things that need to sort of give them the heads up and mm -hmm. let them know what. I mean, I guess this is our opportunity to formally thank you once more time during a public meeting, but thank you so much for thank you. Like all of thank your you. work and stepping up and like beyond, certainly beyond what we thought we were asking you to do at the beginning. Oh, you were a great so. board to work with, honestly. It wasn't too hard. So, you know. yeah. So thank you so much. We'll miss you, except you're, you know, just an expert. So you can still come by and say <laughs> hi. Yeah, like if you're do if you're not busy at 930 on a Wednesday and say <laughs> <laughs> Or 1025. Or 1025. <laughs> well, I was figuring like you want to get in on, on after that last oh, yeah. hour. <laughs> then I move to adjourn. Oh. Wait, but were there any other I topics? I move to Brendan. Go ahead. I don't uh, think there were any other topics. Corrected contracts. The spelling errors are fixed, so we can sign it. Oh, okay. So that's what the printer oh, was. Oh, that was oh. what the printer was. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay, so but we can, but we can, we'll sign that and, uh, yeah, any other topics? All right. Then I move to adjourn the meeting. Second. Okay. <laughs> okay. Any, Somebody. any discussion? <laughs> All in favor? Aye. Aye. All right, thank you. Thank meeting, you, everybody. Thank you. Meeting adjourned at, what is it? 10.24. 10 10 10 10 10 10 10